We're talking today with Chuck Hawkins of Nindlechuk, Alaska, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Chuck, can you start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, uh, where and when were you born? Carmel, California, August 1st, 1946. Okay, and did you grow up there, or did you move around? Uh, my dad was mustered out of the service after World War II at Fort Ward, California, mm -hmm. that's close to Carmel. Right. Uh, when he mustered out, uh, after some uh, medical treatment, uh, we all moved back to Penn State, uh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. where he finished uh, university. Mom had already finished and she was uh, engaged in, in working. And in 1950, a federal recruiter came by and asked if uh, people would like to become school teachers in the territory of Alaska. They were educators by, they had a, a minor in education. Dad had a degree in forestry, mom had a degree in home economics. And they took advantage of the opportunity to go to Alaska and teach school. They liked it and we stayed. All right. Yeah. Now what part of Alaska did you wind up in? The assignment was at a village called Nanilchik, which was settled by Russians in 1792. Uh, so it's a very old historic town. It, it predates a, a lot of the rest of America, but it's Russian in origin. It was a two-teacher school, mom taught grades. 1 through 6, dad taught grades, 7 through 12, uh, two-room school with pot-bellied Franklin stoves in each of the classrooms. But uh, we homesteaded there on the Kenai Peninsula, mm -hmm. and that homestead still exists today. My brother and I share the property, uh, and I'm responsible for the old uh, cabin that we grew up in, and it's a little bit, it's a cabin, but mm -hmm. it's got two levels and three bedrooms and two baths and it's reasonably uh, good size for that time of life when people were homesteading yeah. there. Now, was the population of that area, were there uh, Indians or Aleuts there or was it mostly um, you know, white settlers or people who had been there a long time? There had been Indians in the peninsula when the Russians yeah. got there. Mm -hmm. They had largely uh, been integrated, married out, or, or moved out uh, by the Russian settlers back in the late uh, 1700s, early mm -hmm. 1800s. And uh, by the time we got there, there there was a lot of Russian influence over names like Dimitrov and Askolkov and Kwasnikov and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. But the, uh, the Indian influence could only be seen in the somewhat darker shades of skin on the on the Russian speaking population. Nanilchik at the time the village proper had about 136 people. The schoolhouse was on a hill overlooking the village and it sat beside an old Russian Orthodox Church mm -hmm. which is still there today. The schoolhouse is long gone. But the Russian Orthodox Church is maintained and it's one of the it's one of the dozen or so iconic Russian Orthodox churches in Alaska. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the other ones are bigger and more interesting but and Nelchik has its Russian Orthodox Church. Right. Um, so what was it like growing up in a place like that? Or? Well, I didn't have a frame of reference until I left there to see what it was like somewhere else. <laughs> and I used to joke with my classmates at West Point that you had a paper route when you were a kid and I worked in a fish cannery. Well, some guys worked in fish canneries too, I'm sure. but. Growing up there, you hunted and you fished, mm -hmm. and, and you just sort of accepted that there were things that were different. Uh, I understood that milk came from a cow, not from a can, but the milk I drank came from a can, or it was powdered and came mm -hmm. in a box. Uh, we didn't have much of a dairy farm industry up there, just for an example, although the neighbors did try to make a go at dairy farming, they just, they just never could make it because the market wasn't there. Mm -hmm. uh, so growing up there was different than the average American experience, but then what's average? I mean, everybody looks at Leave it to Beaver and said, well, that's, that's the average American. Well, it's not. Mm -hmm. you know, and I, today I find I have much more in common growing up with most of the people I know who came from smaller towns. Mm -hmm. The common denominator then, I suppose, would be small town growing up. Right. 
I just had, it just happened to be a little colder. But night, winter days were a little bit shorter, and summer days were a little bit longer. Right, and you had more Russians around. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, okay. So uh, now, did you say that your your father taught through high school or just through the middle grades, or? Dad taught grades seven through twelve. Okay. He said, okay. Yeah. So so you did your high school there, or did he send you somewhere else? Oh no, we moved around. Uh, Folks got assigned to a place called Dillingham on Bristol Bay, and and we taught there in the 54, 55, 56. We'd always come back to the homestead mm -hmm. on the Kenai in the summers, okay. you know, the teaching profession being what it is. And then Dad got, uh, long story short, he had an opportunity to serve with the State Department in Pakistan, the state of Alaska, the territory of Alaska, the federal people said, no, we want you to stay here and become the director of Indian Affairs. And so Dad took the the higher the lo the higher paying local job right. as opposed to the State Department foreign job. Okay. So how was it that he had the sort of connections that made those offers possible? And they went in Alaska, I mean maybe, but did he so he had his life as school teacher, but then but did he network somehow with other people or was just applying for things? No, it, I think it was more networking. I mean, you don't come to a... Remember back in the day, there were a lot of veterans mm -hmm. who were finding their way after World War II. And a lot of them were coming to Alaska, and a lot of Tenth Mountain guys were moving out okay. west. And the, the, the Keystone uh, Ski Area in Colorado was founded by a Tenth Mountain Division guy. My dad was in the Tenth okay. Mountain Division. He moved to Alaska. One of the one of the guys who served in the Tenth Mountain with him was an attorney up in Anchorage, mm -hmm. Tom Stewart. And later became a legislator. Uh, so it's a combination of networking, interest, luck, you know, luck of the draw, uh, a little bit of native talent, a little bit of education, and then after not too many years, Dad was not just teaching school, but he was running for state legislature. Okay. All right, and that network and the rest of that, that also kind of explains sort of the next question, which is, how did you wind up going to West Point? Well, I had very little to do with my father. Mm -hmm. He left the family when I was 11. Okay. We were in Juneau at the time. That Alaska had just become a state. That was the big celebration. Uh, Dad left the family. We packed up. We moved back to Nanilchek, back to the homestead, which mm -hmm. was always ours to move back to anyway in the summer. And we decided, you know, we made a year-round home out of it, which was not hard. It was a year-round home at Vienna. Mm -hmm. No big deal. Mom taught school then okay. at Anilchik. I went to high school there. All right. And graduated uh, in 1964. And a couple of years before I graduated, I started thinking about what comes next. And two things come next. Both my parents were college educated, and my father and his father and uh, my mom's Dad, I all served in the military, so you're going to go to school and you're going to get, uh, you're going to serve your country. So I started. I got a book called A Thousand and One Schools and Universities." I'm mm -hmm. sure every kid out there has seen this thing, especially in high school when you're starting to where am I going to go? And I, we didn't have any money, mm -hmm. so I started going down the freebies, or I started looking for student loans. Mm -hmm. Where where can I go and you know get a loan? And I noted that the military academies, or the military academy, the naval academy, the air force academy, were all no charge. They paid you. Mm -hmm. So I, I tucked that away in the back of my head. I applied for and got a student loan to go to Seattle Pacific University. As a, if I became a teacher, the loan would be you know, forgiven mm -hmm. or cut in half or whatever the deal was. So I had that sewed up and I was ready to go to Seattle Pacific, and, but I would also applied to West Point. I didn't apply to Annapolis, I didn't apply to the Air Force Academy, I didn't, you know, the Army was what I wanted to do. If I was going to go in the service, go first class, get an education, get the commission, be an officer, do your time, serve the country, figure out what's next later on. Now, aren't there a lot of pieces that have to get put together for a West Point application? You need, did you get a, a congressman or senator's recommendation, or did you just apply generally? I got Senator Ernest Greening to nominate me, which he, which he did after 
I had the appropriate recommendations from school teacher friends and other folks that mom knew in the mm -hmm. community. Uh, she was politically active, so okay. it was not hard to come up with the, uh, uh, the contacts and the connections. Anyway, Ernest Green, the, the irony was Ernest Greening was one of two senators to vote against the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that got us into <laughs> Vietnam, but he was the guy that sent me to West Point. Okay. So you know, thank you, Senator Greening. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm really happy that he didn't carry his, his voting record into you know, making personal decisions on behalf of young cadets. Right. Uh, so I got, you got to be able to pass the physical, you got to be able to pass the, the, the PT test and uh, put the round pegs in the square holes kind of thing and then I got the nomination and I went. Mm -hmm. And I got military orders and they put me on an airplane and they sent me back to the East Coast and I hung around with my mom's family and my dad's family a little bit in Pennsylvania and, and uh, Maryland and then went to West Point. All right. Uh, and now what's sort of the first kind of in introduction that the new arriving cadets get to West Point? When do you start and what do you do? Now this started, uh, I think I entered on July 2nd. It was before mm -hmm. 4th of July. Right. I mean, it's... it's It's making me go back and think about stuff that I haven't thought about for a long time. But you get there and you, you are examined once again to make sure you backbone straight and, and you can squeeze your buttocks together and uh, wear a jock strap and that's about it. And they turn you around three times and they put you in some clothes and they send you out to the quadrangle to meet the upperclassmen. The upperclassmen sort you out and then they send you to your barracks. I arrived with nothing. I had shaving, shaving stuff in a little plastic portfolio. That was it. No suitcase, no gear, zero. And they were very upset with that because they didn't have any, they couldn't tell me to pick up my bag or drop my bag, which is what they were doing to all the other guys who had suitcases. Pick up that bag, drop that bag, put your head in. Uh, so we got past the fact that I showed up with nothing except shaving gear. Mm -hmm. because the Army's supposed to take care of you from right. that, but they give you stuff to wear, shoes. And, so, and that's what they did. At the end of the day, I had everything I needed to dress and undress and go to bed. And it's all the stuff you need to take care of yourself, plus a meal. And then, uh, don't they there, because this is the summer, it's before the actual semester starts, you get some um, version of orientation or hazing or just this is what life in West Point is like? The first two months is, called, is oriented toward getting you acquainted with the military and as you get it, it it's it's the rough equivalent of what a draftee or a new recruit would go through in basic training and that takes about six weeks in the last couple of weeks they start orienting you toward your West Point academic requirements what you're going to have to do the kind of courses you're going to be taking how the routine works what time you get up what time you know the mm -hmm. upperclassmen coming back so you re, they reintegrate, the upperclassmen reintegrate into the Corps cadets, the new cadets, us, uh, get to be integrated into the regular Corps as it, as it reforms after the summer period. And then mm -hmm. everybody's off in the summer period doing various training uh, events or on leave. You get 30 days of leave and 30 days of some kind of military training during the summer. So once our period of instruction, acclimation, and introduction, which they called Beast Barracks, mm -hmm. uh, was completed. Then we were assigned to our academic, or to our regular letter companies for the academic year. Uh, the Corps is divided, at the time, was divided into two regiments of companies A through M. And I was assigned to company E1, Echo 1. Uh, halfway through my time there, they reorganized the Corps into four regiments, and I stayed in E1, so I didn't have to change letter companies. But a lot of guys from the 1st Regiment got reassigned to the 3rd Regiment, mm -hmm. a lot of guys in the 2nd Regiment got reassigned to the 4th Regiment. Uh, yeah. Were they increasing the number of cadets or just making more units out of the ones they had? 
more the latter, okay. but some of the former. Okay. The, the number of cadets was gradually increasing over time. They had a construction program to build new facilities on the academy grounds, new dormitory space, okay. barracks. As you go through the beast barracks treatment, and, and that's the name applies to a certain amount of hazing, and you were describing that with the picking up, dropping bags. How easy or hard for was for you to make that adjustment? Do you think you did it quicker than some of the other guys, or? That, you know, beast barracks was not a problem for me. Okay. So would they, they, would they try to kind of do things to, to frustrate or aggravate the new cadets or provoke them, or? Yeah, mostly it was physical. I don't know how much of it would have been called psychological. Mm -hmm. They wanted to see how you behaved on your stress. You had to memorize a lot of a lot of stuff that seemed silly at the time, but it was it was meant for you to memorize something and repeat it under stressful conditions mm -hmm. of you know pick up that bag, drop that bag, yeah. and tell me what you memorized last night. But it all serves a purpose downstream. If you can't remember the call for fire when you're under fire and you need artillery support for your guys and mm -hmm. you better know how to talk on the radio and call that stuff in. Uh, so it physically was not, I mean it was challenging, but it wasn't something a kid from the wilderness couldn't yeah. handle. Yeah. All right. Uh, now what's the curriculum consist of? What are you mainly studying? Very heavy into math and engineering, science and engineering. Some liberal arts took a year language. Uh, we took uh, military history, we, we called military art. Uh, but I would most I would say seventy percent of the uh, studies involved uh, what we'd call hard science, physics, chemistry, soil engineering, mm -hmm. mechanical engineering, civil. Uh, the total sum of the educational experience at the end of the four years gives you a rough equivalent of a civil engineering degree, although you, it doesn't say that, mm -hmm. it just says Bachelor of Science. Yeah. Uh, you know, today it's much different. Today you can major in language, you can major in math, you can major in physics, you can major in chemistry. They've got a bunch of different majors programs, and some of those programs are not hard science, mm -hmm. but more liberal arts kind of things, which is fine. I mean, things move around, things evolve, things change, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. The older tradition, I guess, was the very top people go into the engineers, so the Robert E. Lees go to the engineers. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and then so, the, the artillery was next, you know, yeah. if you couldn't be an engineer, you were going to be an artillery guy. And there's still a certain amount of that. And it, <clears throat> artillerymen, for example, tend to gravitate in their in their post-career civilian environment, they, you tend to find more former artillerymen in, in scientific endeavors for, for whatever reason. Uh, that's just my observation. I don't know that there's statistics to back that up. All right. Uh, does the... Now, you start out um, as we could call college freshmen. I mean, do you have a different label for them up here in the yeah, first year? The, the, we're called fourth classmen. Fourth class, and then by the time you graduate, you're in the first class. So fourth, third, second, first class. Uh, the nickname is plebe, mm -hmm. uh, but fourth classman will do just fine. Okay. Uh, now, are there differences in terms of the roles you play on the campus, or the way in which you're treated as you go from one class to the next? Well, plebe, plebe year is the year that you get harassed. You, you got to do all the chores. You got to. When the laundry is delivered by the laundry truck, you've got to sort it out and get it, make sure it gets to the right room. Uh, you've got to deliver the mail. You've got to let people know what time of day it is, and it's time to get out to formation. It's time to go to breakfast, lunch, dinner. So we have the plebe standing in the hallway, counting down the minutes. Sir, there's 10 minutes until assembly for breakfast formation. The uniform for breakfast formation is. And then, and he'll come out at five minutes, and four minutes, and three minutes, and two minutes, and at two minutes, he's gone. So this is the last call for assembly for breakfast formation. And the plebe goes out and he stands in formation, and the upperclassmen, you know, it's their, it's their responsibility mm -hmm. after that point to get, right. get into the formation. That's just an example. I mean, right. some, some 
some plebes are treated better in certain companies than other plebes are treated in other companies. Mm -hmm. And some companies have a reputation for being very easy, and some companies have a reputation for being real assholes. Okay. And, and where would you put your company in that scheme? Uh, it's sort of leaning toward the hard end of things, but by no means in the worst category. Okay. All right. So you've got your, your academic side of things. Now, um, what else goes on at West Point during the year? Now, are they bringing in military people from the outside? Do they do you have special events or things like that that go on? During the academic year, it's mostly academics. Okay. Uh, we're carrying course loads anywhere. I think the, the lowest was 17 credit hours in the semester and topped out somewhere around 23, 24, depending upon if you were in your junior, senior year and, and took an elective. You got electives in your junior and senior year and usually one elective per semester in the final two years. Uh, the only thing that we studied that had more of a direct relationship to military performance than it did academic skills was, of course, we loosely called tactics. Once, uh, two times a week, two or three times a week, usually the last course of that day uh, was a course on military tactics. And we'd study all the way from squad, individual skills, squad, and all the way up through platoon, company level. Mm -hmm. At some point we got into battalion and brigade level tactics. Uh, but it was more of a, a study of uh, a historical survey of what had happened in mm -hmm. the Korean War, what had happened in World War II, and somebody pick an event. It would be above and beyond, but at a level of detailed granularity Great, much finer than our military history course. Mm -hmm. and history course, we might study Napoleon. Yeah. But here we might study some no-name captain who took a ridge line in, in uh, Korea mm -hmm. and how he deployed his troops and how they dug their foxholes so they'd have interlocking fields of fire. And what does this mean to you, you know, you cadet, when you become a lieutenant and have to go out and do it yourself? All right. Uh, now your West Point is sort of up the Hudson from New York City. Did you get a chance to go into New York City periodically? Or do they have activities down there? I think I got to go into New York City uh, once for a basketball game when I was a plea. Mm -hmm. We were in the National Invitation Tournament. Uh, Didn't the Corps of Cadets go and march in parades and that kind of thing? Well, we did, but not, the whole Corps doesn't go. Okay. They'll just you know, pick part of a regiment and then be a representative sample. I didn't start going, to, I didn't get into New York City often, maybe twice a year, mm -hmm. for some, for, for some whatever reason. Of course, after plebe year, you start getting weekends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Not every weekend, but you might get one weekend every two months with your buds and you could go into New York City. And one of my classmates had a father who had a condo in the city who was also 101st guy, as mm -hmm. it turns out, jumped in at Market Garden, jumped in at Normandy, jumped in at various operations in, uh, in World War II. Anyway, uh, in your junior year, your senior year, you get more free time and more free time. All right. Now, uh, how aware were you of what was going on in, in, in the outside world, whether at home or, say, in Vietnam? Because you're there, you get there in 64, and Vietnam hasn't really heated up, but there's noises uh, by 68. Right. You know, it's really going. So how aware were you of all that? I think we were reasonably aware, but again, we're, we're kept... <clears throat> We're kept inside a cocoon of, uh, of perspective that shields us somewhat from the other perspective that you're seeing on the regular college campuses. Mm -hmm. And I think what you have is a situation where the cadets are not as exposed as much to the protesters ideas as they are the fact that there are protesters out there who don't like what you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. 
so you're shielded more from, from the idea of it. And of course, that's easy to do because we didn't, I mean, we signed up because we had the other, we had the opposite idea. Right. Uh, so we didn't hate the protesters, but we were aware of them. Mm -hmm. Every time we'd go on a parade in New York City or wherever, you'd have protesters hanging around. Right. And once in a while, you'd have some that try to break into the academy grounds, but that never happened. I mean, it'd be at the gates outside, mm -hmm. miles away. I'm not sure. I'm well, no, actually, that, quite that, that was that was part, part, part of my thing. So you're aware of that. Uh, what about sort of the progress of events in Vietnam? And how much did you pay attention to that? We paid a lot of attention to it. Uh, they made sure it's, that, that we, we started having our tactics classes. We'd start talking about Vietnam. Uh, some guys talked about it more. Some guys got more uh, discussion on it because uh, some of our professors. Well, for example, the, the four-star general who ran Operation Desert Storm, Norman Schwarzkopf, mm -hmm. was a major mechanics professor uh, of mine when I was in my second year. And he'd been back from, I think, a second tour in Vietnam at that time. But this would have been in 66, so his tours were as an advisor, right. I think. Like anyway, um, yeah, we, so we started getting not, not just exposure in the tactics sessions, mm -hmm. but also exposure to professors who had been there. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, time junior year or senior year, my senior year I took an elective on international security, and one of my professors was Pete Dawkins. The Lonely End, and we thought more of him as a football hero, but he was also a guy who had, uh, who had performed admirably, or, or some argue maybe he could have done better. But anyway, he was one of my professors. So the, the point is, Vietnam experience began coming into the classroom from different directions because of the professors mm -hmm. or the, the instructors we had providing the, uh, the lessons. Dawkins was one of those. He was a name brand mm -hmm. because he played football and everybody right. knew who the long hand was. That's not to say other guys like uh, Dawkins' counterpart in the same course was a Lieutenant Colonel Dana Mead, also a combat veteran. And you got, got and, and, and these guys were not all infantry, I mean, mm -hmm. artillery, engineers, aviators. So you started having this perspective on Vietnam creep into the classroom. Uh, in, in very academic uh, environments, but in very real personal experiences. And they wouldn't hesitate to share with you mm -hmm. if the questions came up and there was time and you had your lessons accomplished. You did less bullshitting in math class and you did more bullshitting in mm -hmm. international security. <laughs> That's just the way it works. All right. Now the other piece of the curriculum for West Point is you have training that you do in the summers. Yes. Now what kinds of things do you do between during the summer? The first summer, <clears throat> the first summer, and which is the summer between your plebe and your your third class year, which is also called yearling year, mm -hmm. for obvious reason. Uh, you spend two months in what is the rough equivalent of advanced infantry training or advanced individual training, mm -hmm. and you get uh, you, the whole class goes and is broken into training companies, one through eight, at Camp Buckner out near Lake Popolopan, which is on the West Point Reservation, but 15, 20 miles from the, the academic centers. Mm -hmm. And you train in various aspects of advanced instruction, whether it's art, you get exposed to artillery pieces, you get exposed to tanks, you get exposed to infantry operations, you go to a, a, a mini Ricondo school, which is sort of like a, a junior ranger school that only lasts a couple of days, so it's, it's really pale by comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, you, get expo you, you, you get exposed to what the real army does, but you don't do much more than just sort of touch it. Yeah. And when that's finished, you have a month off, and you come back to West Point, and you start your academic year. Second 
summer, you will be detailed. You start having choices at this point. Uh, it depends on what your preferences are and what your seniors think of you. But you can be detailed as a um, as a soon-to-be second classman. You can be detailed as a squad leader of new cadets coming in. So mm -hmm. you can be in charge of a squad of plebes for a month, and then you go off to do some uh, training in the in a, in a regular army unit. Uh, and, the, and then your final year, you can reverse the process. You can, you know, be a senior cadet in charge of new cadets coming in, and the, which means you'll be a platoon leader, or a company commander, or a train sergeant. And then, when that month is over, you go off and to an army unit, and we call it, it, the term is third. You, you be a third lieutenant, <laughs> well, that, but that's sort of hokey. I mean, you're you're a, you're a guest of the unit for a month. Uh, and you get exposed to officer life and you get exposed to what real troops sort of look like and everybody mm -hmm. sort of says, oh, well, what are we going to do with the cadets while they're here so they don't really interfere with what we're doing? And so you're lucky to get much actual time with the troops. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they might have a program for you that takes you around their army base and, and to just lets you spend time becoming acquainted with motor pools and radio mm -hmm. communications and, and you might spend very little time actually training. Right. But it's all good. It's all good time and it's all worthwhile and it all gives you a, a perspective. Okay. Now where did you go to do that? I went to Alaska as a matter of fact. And, and it worked out just fine. Okay, so what unit did you visit or what base did you go to? Uh, I went to Fort Richardson. I do not remember the unit. Mm -hmm. I, I think we actually, out of a month, we actually trained with the unit on one field exercise over a three-day period. Mm -hmm. uh, what stuck with me from that three-day period was infantry radios and track vehicles do not talk to armor radios. You've got to have the artillery. There's an overlap. Mm -hmm. Infantry bandwidth, artillery bandwidth, armor bandwidth. So if you wanted to talk to the armor, you had to have some armor radio to bypass the, but the armor and the infantry both had to talk to the artillery. The other weeks, we they bundled us up in a Air Force plane. They took us to Nome for a couple of days and they paraded us through Nome mm -hmm. and uh, part of a, a Nome Day celebration and the army participated in that. And mm -hmm. so, but the best part was they had the uh, the unit was going up to include in the glacier for uh, mountain and glacier training and we spent uh, just over a week up there camped out uh, and we went up in a glacier and we taught how to rope across crevasses how to tie the right kind of knots to get down in and get back out and how to rescue people and how to mm -hmm. come down an ice face with A climbing axe, and you know, just that's anything having to do with glaciers and mountain climbing. We spent a week doing, including rappelling and, mm -hmm. and stuff. That was that was interesting. It was individual skills. Yeah. That, that, that was something the active army guys were going to do, whether cadets were there or not. Mm -hmm. Cadets weren't going to interfere with it. They were just going to be part of the same training. Everybody did it from the colonel on down to the private. All right. Uh, uh, and then did you have? Another assignment, um, did you go two different things or just that, just to Alaska? Just to Alaska. Okay. And then for one month, yep. and my, my, at that year, that summer, my other assignment was as a uh, platoon sergeant of new cadets right. coming in. Right. But then you're, you have sort of two, well, you've got Another, well, another year, and did you have another assignment someplace else? Yeah, I, I don't mean to sound confusing here. The year between uh, sec, uh, first, uh, between third class and second class, yeah. the year between yearling and uh, we call the second classmen cows. I don't mm -hmm. know why the hell we call them cows. We call them cows. The, the summer between yearling and cow year, I went to the Army's Airborne School. We had an option. We could give up, we give up some leave, and we could go to, to airborne school. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm 
actually getting it backwards. You better snip this part of the tape out. No, that's, it doesn't, in a way, it doesn't really matter so much exactly what order it is, more what set of experiences do you have over the course right. of your Well, time before I graduated, I, I, the, the summer before I graduated, the summer before mm -hmm. my senior year, yeah. I went to airborne school. Okay. Uh, the summer before that, I was... Uh, that was in Alaska? I was in Alaska. Okay. And then the, Air, the Airborne School summer, when the Airborne School was, was completed, I went back to West Point to be a senior mm -hmm. cadet in charge of new cadets right. as, a, as a platoon sergeant. Okay. And what did the Airborne School actually consist of? We went, we, we went with it as part of a regular Airborne School rotation. There was about 20, 30 cadets went there. We had, uh, we were, we had our own barracks. Uh, we did, the only thing we didn't do that everyone else has to, or all the enlisted guys going there have to do is what they call zero week, which is basically a week of KP, mm -hmm. while class ahead of you graduates. Yeah. Uh, so we were there for three weeks of airborne training. We got to five jumps in in the last week, and, uh, and we went on leave, and then we went back to West Point to do the final, okay. final all right. period. So, so now you finish West Point, so you're going to graduate in 68. Right. That's on schedule. Okay. Uh, once you graduate, what do they do with you? Uh, you get leave. You get two months of leave. You go do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, you report into your new duty assignment. Okay. Uh, now, do you get um, another any other kind of, of, of schooling? or Because some people, I think, would go to like Fort Benning oh, for well, injury basic and that kind of thing. It, your first duty assignment tends to be the basic course of the branch that you go into. If you go into signal, you go to signal officer's basic course. But you get your leave first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you're going to go. So you graduate in June, June, July, sometime in August, early August, you're reporting into a school. Okay. And then which school did you do? Well, I was an infantry mm -hmm. guy, and I went to Fort Benning to attend the infantry officer's basic course. Right. And then after that, which lasted 12 weeks. I had a couple days off, and I then went to the uh, the Army's Ranger School, which is a two two month nine week course. Mm -hmm. and when that was completed, then I had some leave time, a couple weeks off, and I went to my first duty assignment. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the schools. What does Infantry Basic School add to what you got at West Point already? It actually adds quite a bit. It lets you crack open the manuals. It lets you be with other lieutenants, not just West Pointers, although there, you have a number of classmates with you, but you'll be exposed to ROTC graduates, OCS graduates, everyone in, this is one way the Army has of bringing everybody onto the same page. One common set of standards, one common set of, this is how you guys are going to be, whether you came from West Point, ROTC, or, or, or OCS. So there's a lot that the Army may not teach you, or cannot, or doesn't have the time to teach you at OCS, or ROTC, or West Point, that they'll bring together. Now we got all these brand new second lieutenants. They all know something, but we don't know what they know. And we know there's a lot they don't know. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start them here with squad tactics, and we're going to take them build them up to platoon taxing, and we're going to let them know how that platoon fits within a company, what company tactics look like. And we're going to tell them that a company front might be 1,500 meters in a defensive posture, but don't feel that that's writ in stone. That 1,500 meters could be a lot broader in the desert, it could be a lot narrower in the mountainous jungle. Mm -hmm. So you, they try to teach you that there's book standards, there's things you should do when you don't have any other guidelines, but if you use your head, the guideline becomes a flexible tool that you can apply slightly differently to your advantage in different situations. You learn how to talk on the radio. You learn how to take a radio apart and put it to you on basic first echelon stuff. Mm -hmm. So you learn how to the proper radio procedures, but you also learn what your radio operators are expected to be able to do with that radio. Same with a vehicle. You're, you learn what that driver is supposed to be able to do with that vehicle. 
first echelon maintenance. If it goes beyond first echelon maintenance, then it, somebody else mm -hmm. up the chain has to right. take care of it, the more accomplished mechanic. So you, you learn calls for fire, and you go out and you actually sit in a very secure bunker and you watch artillery shells land all about you, so mm -hmm. you, you know what that's all about. When you're done, you have the basic skills to go out and be a lieutenant platoon leader. Right. Now, are you being trained by people who have been to Vietnam already now? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And how much do they tell you about that? And do they gear much of the training toward Vietnam particularly, or is this still toward going and fighting the Soviets in Europe or something? Well, that's a good question. Most of it's still Soviet-oriented. Most of the Army is still in Europe. Even during Vietnam, when we had a million guys in serving over there or, or in uniform, mm -hmm. most of our force was still oriented towards Soviet Union. Now, that doesn't mean that the best guys in the world were over there. I mean, I, when I was in Europe, we used to joke that we had lieutenants and lieutenant colonels, and everybody else was in <laughs> was in Vietnam. Yeah. All, the, all the captains and majors and the guys that could make it happen. Anyway. We did have a lot of guys with Vietnam experience, and a lot of guys would say now, if you're facing the Soviets, this might be the way to look at it, but mm -hmm. you know, if you're facing uh, North Vietnamese, you might want to look at it another way. Okay, so you have some awareness of that going in. Yeah. All right. And then describe the Ranger School. How does that work? Three phases. Fort Benning phase, the mountain phase up in Dahlonega, Georgia, mm -hmm. the mountain ranger camp, and then they have Florida phase down at the Florida ranger camp, which is near Eglin Air Force Base. Uh, ranger school is sort of a, I mean, you got to do it, you, but you really got to do it. You can't go in there and say, well, they're, they're, they're making me do this, so I guess I better do it. You got to do it. If you don't do it, somebody's going to know you're not in there, you're not wholeheartedly after it. You've got to want that tab. And if you don't want it, they'll find out. They'll find out real, real quickly. The reason it's important is troops look at that ranger tab, and you can be anything else in the world. But if you got that ranger tab, they will give you up front without knowing who you are. They'll give you some of their confidence. Now you, I mean, you can destroy that confidence in a minute. Mm -hmm. But if you got that ranger tab. They feel good about you going in, so it, it buys you it buys you five minutes of their respect right. when you first get there. So, what does it tell them about you if you've gotten through Ranger School? What does that say about you as an officer or as a soldier? It says he can walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, uh, well, it's I'm it's not trying to make light no, of it. Look, but, but it's, it's, it's the toughest school I've ever been to. Uh, and it's the school that taught me the most in a short period of time about how to survive in combat. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have those skills, uh, I mean, you'll get, you're going to get them one way or the other, or you're not going to survive. Ranger School teaches you how to talk on the radio, how to call for fire, how to account for your troops, and uh, how to read a map. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is a bonus. It teaches you how to plan. It teaches you how to plan under pressure. It teaches you how to plan when you're tired. And then to teach it teaches you how to take to move from a plan into execution. Uh, and it teaches you that uh, the guy who plans it may not be the guy who executes it. He might be the planner and then the, the ranger instructor will say, okay, you're done. Next guy, if you were paying attention, here's a plan. You get to execute it. And mm -hmm. hopefully the guy's paying attention. If he wasn't paying attention, you know, too bad. But the main thing is talking on the radio, reading a map, counting for your troops, and uh, knowing just knowing where you are. If you can, if you can read a map, you'll you pass Ranger School if you're tough enough. Mm -hmm. but, now, what proportion of people don't get through Ranger School? Uh, about forty percent. Okay. So this is this is something where they really are, to a certain extent, weeding people out, or, or physically or mentally, you can't make it. That's going to show. And and guys will get hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, guys will break a leg or they'll get blisters that can't be fixed in a week. Some guys get recycled into a subsequent ranger class. Uh, other guys just never happens. All right. 
Now, you got part part of you has to be lucky. Okay. Uh, all right. So you get once you do it. So you you had your finished West Point. You had, We were talking about uh, you know, something you get kind of get, get through the ranger school and so forth. So you've done all of these different things. Uh, so when do you actually now get to go to your first duty station? I reported my first duty station in uh, December. December was it? December. Could have been January. I think it was. Yeah, it was January. Of uh, '69, mm -hmm. and where did they send you? Sent me to Germany. That was a, a, a choice that I had, one of few. I went to Germany. I joined the Fourth Armored Division in an infantry battalion located at Kralsheim, Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, the infantry battalion was the first battalion of the 51st Infantry. Keep going. I went over there with the uh, with a classmate and, and a fellow named Mike Bressler, who also happened to be my ranger buddy. Mm -hmm. And he was assigned to the same division, but to a different battalion. He was up in Bamberg in the, I think the first or second of the fifty third infantry. Anyway, that was about uh, 40, 50 miles up the road. We we got together once or twice while we were over there. But Germany was a lot of field training. A lot of showing, you know, waving the flag for the mm -hmm. Soviets and going out to the field. And if the Soviets were watching you, well, they saw the Americans were busy training. And yeah. the more activity you do, the more you're going to be watched, and the less somebody might try to do something. Mm -hmm. So uh, I spent a lot of time in the field, up in training areas along the uh, uh, the East German border, uh, places like Phil Fleckenhall and Phil's Graffin Theater, uh, bomb holder. And we went on a NATO exercise. Our battalion was tasked to be part of the uh, the NATO Mobile Reaction Force. They call it the ACE uh, Mobile Force. Uh, ACE stood for something, ACE. Uh, we went to Greece on a NATO exercise called Olympic Express. And it was just another way to show how NATO forces could deploy, mm -hmm. and they could deploy the different hot. The next year they went to Norway mm -hmm. on Olympic Express, uh, Evergreen Express, or something yeah. like that, whatever it's called. So we went to Greece, and we, we were there for a month up on the Bulgarian border, waving the flag, mm -hmm. and showing, showing the Soviets. To, now, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit too. Uh, too dismissive of this. We had real world missions along with the training mission of going there and training. The real world, the real world mission would be to make it seem as if a single rifle company was really as large as a battalion. So you conducted active patrolling, very visible, very open, not trying to hide anything. Mm -hmm. And you'd rotate, you'd make a scheme to patrol through 10, 15 villages in a day. And you might send a vehicle patrol in, they stop, have some coffee, and pull out. An hour later, it'll be a foot patrol move in. An hour after them, another vehicle patrol in three hours, and then there'd be somebody else come in toward the evening. Somebody come in at the evening hour to have dinner in that village. And you're replicating this. Ten times, right? The soldiers are dog tired. I mean, all they've been doing is walking and riding around, showing, showing their faces and doing normal stuff. But it has the effect to a local or a spy who's watching you that, oh, there's a lot of activity here. Must be a thousand guys. Mm -hmm. When in reality, it's only 125. Right. Uh, now, what kind of responses did you get as American? servicemen in Europe, in Germany or in Greece? I mean, how did people seem to respond to you or view you? 
The Greeks loved us. We had a great time in Greece. The Germans, by and large, loved us or respected us. Mm -hmm. I say love, maybe it's respect. I don't think anyone was afraid of us. I mean, we just won World War II a few, mm -hmm. and a half a generation ago. So if you showed up in uniform, uh, you could pretty much call the shots. It's not like that today, mm -hmm. it's a lot different. Of course, back then a mark was worth 25 cents. You could buy a, you could buy a, a Wiener Schnitzel for half a buck. Mm -hmm. uh, so they like the money too. Yeah, the, yeah, the money, the, money, the money works. But you didn't have a sense that there was kind of a strong sort of anti-war movement there, or the no. American counterculture no. reflecting in that way. No. And I was able to hang out a few times at uh, local bistros with German nationals and enjoyed their company and vice versa. Just doing things that young men do. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, basically, how long was the tour in Germany? One year. Okay, uh, and so then when does that end? Or beginning of 1970 now, or? I got, uh, I left in January of 70. Mm -hmm. And do you get leave home, or do you get reassigned right away, or what happens? I got leave home. Interesting story how this came about. My classmate, Mike Bressler, up in in Bamberg was all over me to go to flight school. He said, Hawk, if we go to flight school, that's nine months. We don't have to go to Vietnam. He said, we can delay the inevitable. Maybe the war will be over by then. This wasn't the express statement, yeah. but this was the implied desire. And I said, okay, Mike, 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 stop it. Oh, come on, we gotta go, we'll go down to Stuttgart and we'll take the tests. We'll so we went down to Stuttgart and we took the tests, uh, you know, medical and the physical and the round peg and the square hole. And we both did well. The rule was back in the day that if you had orders for two conflicting places of duty, you got to choose. Mm -hmm. And Mike and I both got orders for flight school and Vietnam on the same day. Mm -hmm. So he called me up and he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to Vietnam. He said, oh, man, go to flight school. I said, no, the Army's not going to teach me what I need to know in nine months, how to survive in the air that I've already learned in the past mm -hmm. umpty dumpty years how to survive on the ground. I'm going to war. Well, he understood that, but he didn't like it. My wife at the time doubly didn't understand it, and triply didn't like it. I mean, she was really upset. But I went, you know, how that happened is I got back to the States. I had some time off, a couple of weeks. I went skiing in New York, up back at West Point. It's the only time I've been back there to go skiing before mm -hmm. I went to Vietnam. And they had a two-week course in, at Fort Benning for guys who were going to Vietnam. And it was about, about Forgotten the name of the Vietnam Orient mm -hmm. Infantry Officers Vietnam Orientation Course. There were about 150, 200 of us in a class, and this was taught by Vietnam veterans who'd been there and done that, and come back, and mm -hmm. were getting ready to go again. And the course was full of uh, first lieutenants and captains. That was about that was about it. It was two weeks, and it was very, it was very intense, very. It wasn't so much hands-on, but if you were in a classroom, they were showing you maps, they were going over real live honest to God operations, and, and guys were pointing out things like, if it's the dry season, this is one way, and if it's the wet season, it's another, and you can split your forces across this river because there's no water there now, but two months later there'll be a raging torrent, you better not split your force. They, they were really digging into the detail mm -hmm. of how you operate all the way from the delta up to the, the highlands, all the way to the mountains around the Ashaw Valley. And it was there I first saw Gabe Rollison. Mm -hmm. And I just saw him. I mean, he was part of the mix. And I did, did not meet him then, but he was in that class. Uh, so I got done with that class, and uh, I had some more leave time coming. and. Uh, they had 
that they assigned me to, uh, I was to depart out of Seattle, out of uh, McCord Air Force Base, which is next to Fort Lewis. Right. They assigned me to a training company out there for a week, so I'd get another Vietnam orientation course. Mm -hmm. well, I about had it with Vietnam orientation <laughs> courses by this time. And I reported, I had a classmate stationed at Fort Lewis, a fellow Alaskan named George McPell. Got to Fort Lewis, got to the casual company, I told the first sergeant, I said, Top, I've qualified for my weapon you know, three times in the last two weeks, it seems. I've done all this stuff. I've Blah blah blah. And he said, "Hey, here's your port call. And port call means you can get on the airplane and go to Vietnam." Mm -hmm. And it was dated a week later, so he gave me a free week. <laughs> Didn't count as leave or anything mm -hmm. like that. He just said, "Yep, here's your here's your orders." So I went skiing for a week with George, and then I got on a plane and went to Vietnam. All right. Uh, and where do you land in Vietnam? I do believe we came into Cameron Bay. Uh, and then do they process you there? Do you know your orders yet, or do you no. have to wait till you get there? Okay. You have to wait till you get there. <clears throat> Got off the plane, it was hot. You know, Alaska kid in the middle of the gun. It's it hot. Mm -hmm. And I went to the clerk. Well, we all lined up, get in the line, and then the clerk is going to get you your assignment. And you got to fill out all these papers, you know, you're next to Ken, and you're. Mm -hmm preferences and there's five line items for where you want to go and, and I just filled out 101st Airborne Division on each one of them because I knew the 101st was up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. I knew I could read a map easier in the mountains than I could down in the flat delta. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the wet and I didn't like the swamp but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be up where the water drained off the hills and the 101st had the best reputation of any unit in Vietnam. I didn't want to be with a good unit. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy looked up at me and sort of cocked his head as a you are asking for the worst unit in Vietnam. <laughs> no, no, I'm asking for the best one. And so I got my wish. Now what did he mean by worst? Well, he didn't say that. He just sort of looked at me as if, are you crazy? Well, it was the most dangerous unit at that point. Yeah, probably. They'd been on Hamburger Hill the year before and, yeah. and that, that sort of thing. So there's that element to it, or at least that's what I've kind of picked up from other yeah. places. If you want to go get in trouble, that's, that's a place to go. If you want to get in trouble, go to Go to the 101st. All right. Uh, and then within the 101st, what, okay, first of all, how do they get you up to where the 101st is? We took a C 130 up to Fubai. Uh, I did some more in processing there, financial records and all that. You know, just make sure you get paid somehow. I had a classmate in Fubai, mm -hmm. said hi to him. And then they take you. They, they probably put us on a helicopter to take us up to Camp Evans. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm just guessing. It was they, they did not put us on the C-130 because they could have put you on a truck, I suppose. They could have. That's the alternative. I'm, I'm just trying to think if I rode up in the truck, and I don't think I did. Mm -hmm. So I think it was they, they ferried us up in a helicopter. It could have been a Chinook. Take 20 or 30 of us yeah. at a time. But once again, there's a. Vietnam orientation course waiting for you. Mm -hmm. It's called the Screaming Eagle Replacement Training Center, S-E-R-T-S, -S, mm -hmm. CERTS. And it's two weeks, and I lasted a week, and I knew the battalion I was assigned to at this point, did mm -hmm. not know anything beyond that. Second battalion, 506 infantry. At the end of the first week, I called the battalion uh, headquarters talked to some NCO in the, in the personnel section. I said, send a jeep over here and get me. <laughs> and, you know, five miles away, but you know, mm -hmm. not four miles away, but however it was, right. it wasn't that far. And lo and behold, their jeep shows up. The senior sergeant leans out, said, you, Lieutenant Hawkins, you betcha. I threw my shit in the back of the jeep. And it, a certain classmate of mine, second lieutenant Dudley Davis, said, "Well, I'm going with you. I've had enough of this too. You know, I, maybe I impressed him or something. Mm -hmm. He would be like Chuck. So he was going at the same time. We got there. 
and it dumped us out in the battalion headquarters. And Colonel Lucas, the battalion commander, was in the rear at the time. And just talking to the driver or the NCOs and whatever, you start to build your little stories. You're over there at search for mm -hmm. a week. Where, where are you going to be assigned? Oh, the 2nd Battalion, well, they're good. They do this, they do that. So you, you start picking up bits of information about the enemy. I knew Lucas was a West Pointer. I knew he was class of 54. Uh, I knew that if Davis went in to see him first, that I would probably have more face time with him seeing him second because there was only the two of us. So I encouraged Davis to go go ahead. Okay. I want to pause right here. This tape is about up. Uh, okay. Now it's not complaining. All right. Uh, we had gotten to the point where we have now gone up to join the 2nd Battalion of the 506th Regiment, 101st Airborne Division, up at Camp Evans right. in Vietnam. And this is about March of 1970 now, or February still? Yeah, you know, this would be March. I got over to Vietnam February 22nd. This would be March. Very beginning of March then. Yeah. We spent a week at certs before quitting. Yeah, one, two, three, somewhere around there. Yeah, okay. All right, and you are about to meet the battalion commander, right. Lieutenant Colonel Andre Lucas, and you've calculated that you want to spend some time talking to the guy, so you let the other guy go first? Right. All right. So Davis comes out, and he's been assigned to Alpha Company. He's all happy he's going to be a platoon leader. He's a pretty gung-ho kid. He's from Colorado. He's a nice, you know, nice guy. I go in and get to talk to Lucas a little bit, and I... And now it's pretty close to up front that I want to be a company commander. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, we're going to see how you do as a platoon leader first, and then we'll make, we'll make a decision on you commanding the company. And that's fine, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's to be expected. But I put my marker out there. So he assigns me to Charlie Company. So I come out, and Davis and I go over to the mess hall and get some there. The next few days, getting oriented to Charlie Company, getting my gear stowed. Uh, Lucas arranges for us to be taken around to different places to get sort of oriented on the battalion. We go out to Firebase Jack. I see Rollison again. His company is securing Jack. Mm -hmm. Got there well ahead of me. I uh, got to see Dave Rich, the legendary artillery battery commander of Bravo Battery, 2nd of 319th, mm -hmm. he was there. Uh, interesting little event happened on Jack when I was getting this orientation tour. Uh, Lucas was, he wanted to experiment with, uh, what are we going to do with all these, these infantry machine gun links and shell casings. It's just trash, right? What if we put it in the bag and stuffed it down the snout of a 105 howitzer and loaded up charge one? Do you think it'd be like a beehive round? He, he wanted to throw crap out there. Mm -hmm. So Rich said, well, we can try that. No, nobody's thinking about screwing up the lats and law the rifling on the barrel. Nobody's <laughs> thinking about it. It's just, you know, it, and, a grunt's beehive round, all this, mm -hmm. this brass and trash. Well, it didn't work very well. They set up some some empty ammo boxes as if they were people at about at about 50 meters. And it, it just, a beehive round works. Mm -hmm. Ammo casings and, and links from a machine gun don't work too well. So it just gets kind of a spray of stuff. It, it, doesn't yeah, shoot it out just, very far. just yeah. throws a bunch of crap out there. But it, but guys are innovative. Mm -hmm. Guys think about things. Guys try stuff, and that was one of the things that I learned early on. Is man, if it's not in a book, that doesn't mean it can't be tried. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's if it's up here, get it out there and, and see what people think. So the idea was innovation. Doesn't matter if it worked. If it didn't work, don't use it but innovate whenever you can. Okay. Now, uh, where was Charlie Company at this point? Charlie Company was at a place we called Rocket Ridge, which was the first major, the first ridge line before getting into the series of ever-increasing ridges and uh, hills that lead to the Ashaw Valley. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I joined Charlie Company on March 7 or 8. Okay. Took over, took over second platoon. My classmate, again, another classmate, one of West Pointers here. Uh, Charlie Lee had been commanding that platoon, and, and uh, Charlie had a good reputation in a battalion. He was well thought of by his troops, and the troops uh, wanted to know who was taking his place. Mm -hmm. And to Charlie's everlasting credit and, and my thankfulness, he said, Oh, I got a classmate coming out here, and he's an airborne ranger, so you don't have to worry about a thing. The troops said, oh, whew, man, that's good to know. All right. Uh, so how do you um, introduce yourself to the troops, or what approach do you take to kind of get to know the unit and start leading them? Uh, Charlie and I have an overlap of a day. Mm -hmm. He spends the first night, uh, and he takes off with the chopper the next morning. He's got a job in the tactical operations center up at the time. Uh, so we have that overlap. That I, I meet the platoon sergeant, the medic, the radio operator, mm -hmm. uh, the squad leaders, and that's pretty much it. And then the next day, leave is gone, and I ask the platoon sergeant to take me around the perimeter. I just want to see all the positions. I want to say hi to all the, the men. Mm -hmm. So I do that. They, they get to see me, and I, I'm not going to know them that well up front, but I'm, they're going to know who I am and I'm going to start getting a sense of which squad leader does what and where and got back to the command post and mortar rounds started coming in. The enemy was firing at our landing zone and some of the rounds were coming pretty close. I don't think they knew exactly where we were, otherwise we, we would have been targeted hit, but they knew there were some GI. They, they'd seen a helicopter mm -hmm. coming and going. Yeah. So the first now, in the time it takes for nine mortar rounds to come crashing in, that's, that's a lifetime. And this is my first contact. And I remember what a kid told me in, in Germany. Light a cigarette. By the time your hand stops shaking and you get it lit, you'll know what to do. And the troops looking at you, they'll think you're really cool. And that's exactly what I did. And it's not. It didn't quite happen the, the way the, the guy intimated. Doc Shepard had a bunch of hand grenades in his steel pot that he was sitting on. Doc Shepard didn't carry a weapon, he carried hand grenades. He said, I'm not a conscientious, conscientious objector, I, I'm just not very good with a, with a weapon. So I carry hand grenades. If I need to fight the enemy, I want to have a weapon that will that'll get him. I can't hit the broadside of a barn with a rifle. Well, he dumped his helmet of hand grenades into my lap and said, here, sir, you'll need these. And, <laughs> and puts the helmet on his head and he goes off to see if there's any injured guys from the mortar fire. And I'm sitting there with a bunch of hand grenades that need these. I haven't even smoked my cigarette yet. What are you talking about, need these? So I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if put the hand grenades in. Anyway, long story short, the firing stopped. I went to one of the positions that the guys had been firing back at where they thought the enemy might be. I cranked up a patrol. The squad leader and I went out with three or four guys. We poked around for half an hour, 45 minutes, didn't find anything, came back. Uh, you know, what that did was it let the enemy know we would respond in some way. And then we moved. Checking with the platoon sergeant, but I'm saying I think you know we've been here long enough. Time to move to a different location. So we were starting to get rucked up, and uh, company commander came in. I said, oh, "Shit, okay." Well, we talked about the mortars. He said, "Yeah, okay." Fire some artillery. He wanted to know how many troops I had. I told I knew I had a guy in the rear with the Kit Carson scout. You know, the, repatriated North Vietnamese. They were undergoing some training. And I, so I knew where all my guys were. Where, where are we in the map? Well, I said, we're here. And he said, well, I think we're here. I said, no, sir, we're here. He said, well, call an artillery marking route. 
on that hilltop up there. And if it's the, if it's there, then we're here. And if it's there, then we're over here. I said, okay. So I called an artillery marking round, and it landed over the, the hilltop that lined it up with where I said we were. And uh, Vasquez turned around and said, okay, uh, my, uh, my helicopter will be your visual reconnaissance bird. You can go up and you can recon and see if you can find out where that enemy fire was coming from. I'll go talk to your soldiers. So I flew around with a crazy pilot for about 30 minutes. I mean, this guy was in and out of the trees like you wouldn't believe. Sometimes he'd go into a dead end and he'd back out. There'd be trees overhead. We got back on the ground. I didn't see anything. Vasquez got in the chopper and said, okay. So we prepared to move out to our new location. And here's what Vasquez accomplished in a very short period of time. He knew I knew how many soldiers I had and where they all were. Mm -hmm. He learned that I would argue with a senior officer when I knew I was right. And he knew I could read a map because I was right. And he knew I could call for artillery because I called for artillery marking around to prove I was right on the map. And he said, well, let's see if he can ride in a helicopter. And I got the ride of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't lose my cookies. So, you know, Vasquez learned very quickly if you can, what what my level, you know, where, where I was in the class and what he would need to do to, to mentor me mm -hmm. or, or how much he could have confidence in me to do certain things. Uh, well, he, he seems to be a pretty distinctive character. He's, he's legendary. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely a legend. All right. But you've sort of passed your first set of tests. I passed tests. my first set of tests. And the second test came later on that night. I don't know how much detail you want. This is, to me, it's uh, it's really interesting to, to unravel, to analyze, mm -hmm. to unravel what the enemy was trying yeah. to do, what we were trying to do. Uh, Tape is cheap. So. Tape is well, cheap. <laughs> So what does happen? Then? Need a need a map or a sand table. Um, Rocket Ridge. There's an old old fire base which is not very big and it's not very high. It's not very important, but it's on Rocket Ridge. It's called Helen. It's at the one end where we were working. You go beyond Helen along Rocket Ridge, it becomes higher and higher, and eventually you come to a much more mountainous area, fire base O'Reilly, and then. Beyond that and farther to the north is Ripcord. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, Rocket Ridge is maybe 300 meters above sea level, so it's not that high. Uh, Charlie Vasquez has two platoons on the forward slope facing the South China Sea and two platoons on the back slope facing the rest of the mountains. And he's working along Rocket Ridge, and some and some of the platoons are up higher. And some are down lower. I was down lower on the on the back side. And the enemy had an area they had a unit called a K-12 Sapper Battalion. And the Sapper Battalion, we learned, had been had been tasked to find out if it was easier to send sappers, specially trained infiltrators against infantry units in the field as opposed to sending the highly trained sappers against infantry units defending fire bases. This was a time of year when we weren't manning as many fire bases as we would be manning within the next 30 days. So they had the luxury of time and resources to put against this experiment. The theory we, we gathered was that infantry units in the field are not as well defended. They don't have barbed wire. They maybe have foxholes, maybe they don't. They don't have a lot of claymores. They just have a few claymores. The fire base is harder to attack. GIs in the field should be easier to attack. In fact, the opposite is true. GIs in the field are so much more alert, so much more alert, mm -hmm. that they don't need all that extra defensive stuff that you see on a fire base. Plus, the fire base has so many more inviting targets 
and the infantry guys in the field, they are the target. There's, there's nothing else out there to invite attention. They're defending themselves. They're not defending a hilltop or a artillery battery or a radar set or a tactical operations center. So the, the enemy experiment ended up failing miserably. I mean, just really miserably. They lost a lot of guys. Well, they were testing their theory out on Charlie Company mm -hmm. on Rocket Ridge. And Vasquez's response was, was to send out a series of small six-man ambushes along the ridge. He said, if they want to they attack us, let them attack a lot of little locations. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of little locations will even be more alert and we'll clean up more of them, which we did. And, and we, my platoon was moving up toward the ridge that night or that e afternoon when we settled into a, and it wasn't much of a defensive position. It was, no, it was just the side of a ridge. Right. And that night, these ambushes sprung on the, on the sappers and we heard a bunch of bad guys coming down through the brush, you know, running through the woods. They stopped, and you could hear them chattering. And they they were they weren't 50 feet from our perimeter. They didn't know we were there. And the troops are going. Well, I know we had claymores out there. Of course, in in a defense like that, where they don't know where you are, even when they know where sort of where you are, you, you don't want to fire machine guns or rifles. You want to throw grenades or blow claymores because mm -hmm. they don't give away your location. So uh, I got forward to where the, the bad guys could be heard, and I listened, talked to one, I said, okay, well, let's blow a claymore and see what happens. And we did. And there was a pregnant silence. You could hear it throughout the entire jungle. Not a creature was stirring. And then they just fired. RPGs wildly into the night. I mean, you could see the trails and stuff, and then running away. And I, I, then I call up the company command post and I said, I need some artillery down here. Mm -hmm. and got some artillery fire, and I don't know if that was effective. But we sure surprised them. We went out the next morning and we, we picked up all sorts of stuff RPG vests, RPG rounds, medical stuff. One of the guys had one or more had been wounded. There was a lot of tape and, and gauze and some bloody bandages. So that was sort of a good feeling. And I continued up the ridge, uh, made a night defensive position on the ridge that night. Nothing happened with us, but Vasquez's the platoon he was with farther down toward this place called Helen was hit by sappers. Vasquez, the platoon he was with, stopped those guys cold. Mm -hmm. One of the things Vasquez did was he told he had the platoon put a trip wire on the trail along the top of the ridge, way, way, way out, a couple hundred meters. And you couldn't see it, you couldn't cover it by fire, it was just there. So the enemy came along and they found that trip wire. And they started being cautious 200 meters before they should have been cautious. By the time they got up to where Vasquez really was, they were tired of being cautious. And they started making mistakes. So Vasquez would, would play these little, little deception stunts with them, and they worked. And then we hold up on, on Helen for a couple days. Vasquez pulled two of the platoons in there. I'll just continue if you don't mind. No, just keep going. You're doing fine. I, I went on my first ambush. I think I'd already been in an ambush, but hadn't. I told Vasquez I wanted to do it, and I told him how I wanted to do it, and he said, okay. So we took, uh, I, it was just 200 meters away from the perimeter platoon perimeter with the company CPs and I just took four guys 
myself and three others. But we went out with 20 guys. Four of us dropped off. 20 guys continued for two, 300 meters, turned around and came back. Made it look like a last light security patrol. Mm -hmm. And if the enemy is counting GIs going out and GIs coming back, they better be real accurate because they're going to see a bunch going out and they're going to see a bunch coming back. But the bunch coming back was a bunch minus four. And they taught you how to do this in ranger school. It's not something I picked up in Vietnam. It's mm -hmm. just common sense when, when you really think about it. Well, it rained at me. And every raindrop hitting on those big elephant ear leaves was a bad guy coming down the trail. I mean, every raindrop had us on edge. And I said, oh, crap. Okay, because there's nothing out there. And nothing came out there. Next morning, we were wet, tired, miserable, and we came back in the perimeter. And then the sun came out, and guys were cleaning weapons, and a fellow, I had a machine gun out there, and a the guy on a machine gun was playing in a machine gun. When you take the barrel group off, it's got the gas cylinder chamber underneath the barrel on the M60, and he was running a rod down the bore, and as he turned the barrel, the gas cylinder plug inside the gas cylinder went clunk. It's supposed to go click, but it went clunk. You can tell the difference. Well, the gas cylinder plug was in backward, which effectively made the weapon a single shot weapon. Now, it's not the machine gunner's responsibility to fix that. It's second echelon main. It's armorer's mm -hmm. level. It's the next level up. So the armorer sent out a machine gun that was had plug in backwards, single shot machine gun. So I raised holy hell with the rear and we did it through the company CPF while the chain of command. And I chastised the machine gunner for not knowing the difference. You, you need to know what this sounds like. Now, even though we weren't authorized to take the weapon apart, we took it apart and put the gas cylinder plug in the right way. And don't tell anybody. <laughs> they had a little, they had a a lead seal on a little twisted wire. We just broke the seal, opened it up with a, with a tool and fixed it on the spot. Mm -hmm. Didn't bother resealing it. Somebody wants to put me in jail for breaking a lead seal, that's fine. So little things like that. Mm -hmm. Little things like that. Uh, a lot of men to have confidence in me. At least they, they knew they weren't getting a, a, an idiot. Mm -hmm. Somebody was going to not take the time to think through a problem and, and get you know, I mean, somebody who, who didn't mind having. Now, they were a little concerned that I was a little too aggressive. Yep. I got that later, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have a theory that the enemy ends up picking on the wimps and the aggressive guys, he doesn't bother quite so much. Mm -hmm. So. But you didn't have any problems getting men to actually do what you wanted them to do. Never. That, that's the key there on some level. They can grumble if they want to, but if they're doing the job, then uh, that works. All right. So you're kind of getting uh, some practical on-the-job training at, at this point and, and picking up some experience in situations that are mostly under control, at least initially. Yeah. It, 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 I, I guess looking back on it, Vasquez knew they were yes. under control, but but, yeah. but Chuck Hawkins was on the mm -hmm. was on the fine edge of. Ah, yeah. Don't, yeah. don't know how I'm going to do a year doing this, but it's okay so far. All right. And now you're getting up to the point where the battalion is beginning. You've got plans to to move up to above the Asia Valley to go establish the base on Ripcord and all of this. And they make the first attempt on March 12th, but that's A Company that tries that. Right. Uh, in the, in, and then it's going to take several weeks before it gets established eventually by your company. Uh, so what are you guys doing then in um, that kind of latter two-thirds of March and into April? What kinds of activities now are you engaged in? Well, on March 12th, Alpha Company went into Ripcord. Uh, they called it an exploratory insertion. Mm -hmm. We we all knew that we were going back out into the mountains. Right. At some point, uh, 
Charlie County was, you know, continued to mop up what was left of the K-12 Sapper Battalion, what, what guys hadn't, hadn't fled. Mm -hmm. you know, I was getting increasingly comfortable with operation, you know, with the area of operations. Uh, we moved around, no more contact that I recall off the top of my head. Uh, toward the end of March, and now we're, you know, we're halfway through March, Alpha Company didn't get recorded, it's been a problem, and everybody starts thinking about that. We, we're still operating along rock, Rocket Ridge. Sometimes we're down on the forward slope and sometimes we're on a backward slope. Uh, and, and we're just looking back on it, it was almost like we were in a holding pattern, mm -hmm. doing a three-man weave down the basketball court waiting for the, the word to go, go for the hoop. So we were controlling the ball, but uh, I knew I knew Vasquez was getting ready to go on R and R sometime in April. Battalion, mm -hmm. uh, we're still in March. Battalion, after the Alpha Company didn't take ripcord on 12 March, battalion or brigade or division figured we needed another stepping stone to get to ripcord. We didn't have enough fire support, so we decided to open up a fire base called uh, Gladiator which was halfway between Rocket Ridge and Ripcord. It's maybe eight, ten kilometers off of Ripcord, so it's you know within within range. And Charlie Company was tasked to take Gladiator. And Gladiator was had been a fire base, it was a ball hill the year before, it wasn't much. Um, so we went out there on I believe it was March 30, 29, 30. And that was my first combat assault. So they pulled us into Camp Evans mm -hmm. in the rear for a day or two to get us ready to go on the combat assault to seize Gladiator. So I got to see what it was like with troops in the rear. Mm -hmm. I don't remember much about that, but it was it was okay. And we got you know, we got a clean fatigues and everybody got refitted and got new ammunition and Went out to the pad and we got on the choppers and we made our first assault. I made my first assault, which was interesting. It was sort of startling to hear the Cobra rockets fire on either side of you as you went in. I said, "Holy shit! Okay, that's what that is. All right, got it." And we got on the hill, and just a couple of quick things in rapid succession. Mm -hmm. I learned from Vasquez an early lesson about defense. The simple rule is you defend low. You, you, don't defend, you don't defend from the top of the hill, you defend as low on the hill as you can get. Two reasons for that. The top of the hill is the target, the top of the hill is where the enemy looks for the artillery pieces, the tactical operation center, the radio antennas. You get down low, and down low you've got a better chance of getting fields of fire that give you grazing fire against the enemy. The enemy coming in down low, He'll expose himself for a lot farther distance out mm -hmm. instead of just plunging fire going down from the top of the hill. Will that plunging fire often just go over their heads? Often, often will. And if you can get down low and you can get grazing fire going out for you know, 200 meters, why wait for that last 50 feet yeah. of plunging fire going down there? So I learned to defend low, even if it's uncomfortable, which it often is. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not convenient to be down the side of a hill, but it's a hell of a lot better. Went on an ambush again. I took a kid with me that uh, had the jitters. Some people might say he had a serious attack of the night vapors. And that uh, taught me never, never, never take a kid out there that you weren't sure could perform. He just he kept hearing things in the in the elephant grass that weren't there. Of course, I didn't pick a very good ambush spot. There weren't very many good ones to pick. So you know, I didn't say anything. I just brought him back the next morning. Uh, I learned that the old man Lucas did not 
like to clean his weapon. He had a rusty carry car 15 and the fucker was rusty. I said, no, that's not right. It's not right, man. Let's clean that thing. And I met Dave Rich for the first time and uh, was impressed. Not that, and he didn't pay any attention to me. He was there talking to Lucas and Vasquez. But he just impressed me as, as being a guy who knew what was going on. Uh, now, did they put his guns on Gladiator at that point? They did. Okay. They did. So after Gladiator, I think Vasquez went on R and R from Gladiator. Mm -hmm. I brought another company in to secure Gladiator, maybe even from another battalion. Vasquez made me the acting company commander before he left. Mm -hmm. And I argued with him about that. I said, I'm the junior lieutenant. He said, you're the senior lieutenant. I said, I don't have as much combat experience as your other lieutenants. And he said, you're the senior lieutenant. I said, you should put, uh, you should put Wallace or Campbell in charge. They know better than I do what's going on. He said, you're the senior lieutenant. Got it. Mm -hmm. So we combat assaulted into the Ripcord area sometime around April 3, 2, 3, 4. I mean, you can yeah. check it with me. We combat assaulted in that little LZ that was east of Ripcord. Alpha Company was there. And I think this was probably on the second or third. So it was after Alpha. It was, it was Alpha. B Company had landed on April 1st or tried to on Ripcord. That was the April Fool's Day assault. Mm -hmm. B Company pulled off. Alpha Company moved in to provide cover for them. Uh, and then we went in to add more weight around Ripcord. So I think we probably went in around April 3 or 4, okay. somewhere around there. Could have even been the 5th, but it, it, whatever. Alpha Company was securing the LC. Bravo Company had been pulled out. It, it took a day to pull them out. I mean, it, this didn't happen easily. And Alpha got me been in a fight uh, helping Bravo Company, helping cover for Bravo Company. So people were back and forth, people were getting, getting a little antsy, and we, we realized a fight was brewing. So we got on the ground, and I, I just remember not being. I remember hoping it didn't happen to me because I didn't like the way these guys were were situated. I didn't like the way they were looking. I didn't like the feeling of you know being being beat by the bad guy the way I thought they had been beat. Now, maybe it was just an attitude. Maybe it was me being I didn't know mm -hmm. my ass from all around, so don't know what I'm looking at. Uh, and maybe it's just okay. We're the new guys in the AO. We're going to be looked down at by the guys who've been there like, you, know, you don't know what you're in for, but you're going to find out. So, you know, some combination of that. But I just remember feeling, I don't want to be like this. I want to be different from this. Mm -hmm. I want to be better. So I broke the company up into two groups, two platoons each, just keeping a little bit of strength together. And we started working the, uh, the south side of Ripport. Down around, down to Ward Hill 902, mm -hmm. out to Ward Hill 1000, and it's and not quite to 805, but, but close into the hill, mm -hmm. not not close into Ripcord, not way out. Right. And I think it was on the eighth, seventh. We got in a nice little firefight with the two platoons that had pushed the farthest toward Hill 1000. And it, uh, that didn't work out very well. So I was learning, you know, don't be so arrogant that you think the guys you feel look bad when you get on their LZ, don't think you can't be like that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, it, it just, it wasn't a matter of making a mistake, it was a matter of the enemy knew more than we did about the area mm -hmm. and, and how to handle things. He damn, it, 
not ambush, but he he just bumped into the two platoons toward Hill 1000 that started a firefight, almost as if to see what, what we would do. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do very well. I didn't do very well. Uh, we called in artillery and covers and all that good stuff. And that night, the enemy rolled our own hand grenades down on top of us and uh, fired our own M79 grenade launchers at us. Stuff they had captured from Ripcord from Bravo Company mm -hmm. a week before. That wasn't very pleasant. And I refused to get the whole company involved. I did not go there with reinforcing platoons with the idea of driving the enemy off. Mm -hmm. I just figured two platoons can handle it. And there wasn't that many enemy. Just that they had the advantage and they had the high ground and they dicked with us all night long. So what kind of casualties did you take in that couple days? I had some guys wounded. I had to bring a medevac in. I went out there the next day. One guy had to I don't, I don't recall if I had a guy killed, but no. I, I don't think I did. I think we just wounded guy. Yeah. Some of them were were, were unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And one one kid, you know, I walked up to him and I asked him how he was doing. And he just he looked at me as if I was the worst worst scum on the earth, and he turned his back on me. Mm -hmm. And his back was just ripped apart with fragment scratches, and scars, and cuts all the way down to his shoulder blades. I said, okay, I know how you're doing. Mm -hmm. We'll get you out of here. And we brought a chopper in, we used a jungle penetrator, and we got guys out. And then I pulled the platoons back. I kept the company loosely together at that point. And the next day or two, Lucas came out and said, you're taking ripcord, and here's, here's when. Mm -hmm. He brought Herb Kerningsbauer, the S3, with him. Designed a company plan, just like the book says to do. Mm -hmm. One third planning time for me, two thirds for, for the platoons, and the platoon release points, squad release points. When we went up the morning pre dawn of April 11, we fired artillery. We hit the platoon and squad release points. At dawn, we broke over the hill, and not a shot was fired. It was ours. We owned it. Now, given that when A and B companies would go on, and especially B company, the enemy had mortar fire trained on the top of the hill and, and the rest of it, do you have any idea why it was they weren't shooting at you? Curious. They're curious to see what comes next. Mm -hmm. I think they knew we were going to take that hilltop no matter what. And I think they felt as if, as long as they have a, a, a high value target to shoot at, like a helicopter, that uh, as long as we're stupid enough to try to take it with helicopters, they're going to shoot down a helicopter. Mm -hmm. Okay, now they tried it twice with helicopters, that didn't work, now they're doing it a different way. Let's see what they're up to now, let's see okay. what they're thinking about. That's just, I'm just thinking, yeah. you know, yeah. if it were me, I'd be curious. Let's see, how long does it take the enemy to learn? Well, it took us two tries to learn. But now we're up there. Okay, let's see what they do. And once you got there, what did you do? We got busy. The mm -hmm. uh, battalion sent a jump talk, an advanced tactical operations center out there. Sid Davis, Major Davis, the XO, came out. Had a liaison from the S3 shop. We had the artillery guy. We had we developed the ability to operate the battalion from that location uh, if we needed to. Mm -hmm. I had platoons assigned to sectors. I remember what Vasquez said about defending low. We got we got off that hill as much as possible because mm -hmm. we knew there was stuff coming in and. Uh,
Davis wanted to make sure we had defensive wires strung around there. And we just got a load of wire, the concertina, and we had some spools of barbed wire, but we didn't have any engineer sticks. And we finally got those out. He, he came over and said, I want to strand a concertina up around this fire base by nightfall. And I was just sort of feeling busy and, and I knew what I was doing, don't bother me. And I said, sir, when I get the right tools, I'll get it in. We didn't have sledgehammers, we didn't have gloves, we didn't have any of that stuff. We just had them. And he heard this pregnant pause. And he exploded. He said, well, then very, very forceful way. Maybe the most forceful I've ever heard a human talk to me. So you get that wire. I don't care if you have to wrap your hands in sandbags and use rocks to pound of stakes in, but you get that wire in. You get it in before nightfall. You have not been on a fire base and been overrun. And I have. And I am not going to do it again. And you are not going to be the reason I do it again. So get your hand out. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you get the idea. Now, Davis and I ended up being good friends, but I think that Astro was one of the reasons we became good friends, mm -hmm. because I turned right around and I put sandbags on my hands and I grabbed rocks and I helped the guys put stakes in the ground and get that concertina out. By the time that night fell, we had three strands of concertina around the hill. Not one, three. And Davis was satisfied. Then the rains came and the fog came and we were out of action, just miserable out of action. Vasquez came back, we had water running through the damn company hooch. And I presented Vasquez with my list of award recommendations. And he said, how many enemies they kill? They're heroes, I mean, they, 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 they got wounded. He said, how many enemies they kill? I said, none. I said, no kills, no awards. Mm -hmm. I said, ah, I learned another lesson. Because you never argued with Vance Quest. I mean, it was no kills, no awards. Oh, okay, got it. Write this down. So, uh, then he made me the executive officer for the company. I hated it. I did not have a response, I did not have men to be responsible for. So I made it my practice in the middle of the night to walk around to each of the foxholes and see how the guys were doing. As I remembered, gee, when we were in Rocket Ridge, we could stay alert for the K-12 guys. Let's see if we can stay alert on the fire base. And we couldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried, but we couldn't. It was different. Somehow it was psychologically different. So I'd slip into a foxhole, and if the guy was awake or if the guy was sleeping, I'd nudge him awake. We'd talk through, what if the bad guy was coming up on your foxhole? What if he was coming up about here? What if he was coming up about there? What if he was doing this? Where are your claymore switches? Where are your claymores located? Do you know where your sectors of fire are? How do you interlock with the guy next to you? What if the sapper comes up in between you? Do you, do you, do you coordinate to kill him before he gets through that third strand to concertain him? How do you know that you coordinate that? How do you know he's dead? Where do you put your flares? Just talk, talk, talk. Mm -hmm. But do. Like look look what you're look what you're dealing with. You understand more than most people because you do this a lot with veterans and you teach the course. Mm -hmm. But it's just common sense. But people don't take the extra effort typically to do commonsensical things. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's on guard. What does that mean? But when I'm done with you in the foxhole, you are on guard. And you know how to guard that position. Mm -hmm. And then when the next guy comes up, we've got to do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did these things as the XO because I didn't want to go back in the rear and run supply. I had the first sergeant and the supply sergeant can do that. And we got ready to leave. We, we choppered out on May 14. Okay, so you're basically there a month yeah. doing base security and so forth. Yeah, there a month. 
So I've got a month at the second platoon leader. I've got a month, at, at, including the little stint as acting company commander. Mm -hmm. But a month in a fire base at Plan XO. And watching the fire base get built, and watching the, the, the guns come in, and the four 105s down on the lower part of the hill, and the Dave Rich's six 105s on the upper part, the 155s in the lower part. And just watching it turn into a real premier fire base, mm -hmm. compared to anything I'd seen that was first rate. And what other guys would tell me, oh, this is a damn good fire base. You know, we can defend this. So we left. All the companies had reorganized to four to three platoons, down from four. Mm -hmm. When I got there, we had four platoons. Now we didn't have enough guys for four. Okay. So, about how many men were in the company at this point? Yeah, maybe eighty. Okay. Yeah, so we're running three twenty-three to twenty-five man platoons. Yeah. And then a company CP. So I'm. I took over third platoon. Paul Berkey was my platoon sergeant arguably the best platoon sergeant I've ever served with. A young kid, uh, young Stan Ohio, blonde, instant NCO, but he, they, they promoted him uh, to E6. They didn't just make him an E5, they said this guy's got talent, so mm -hmm. they didn't make him an E6. He was one of the heroes of the, K, the, the Rocket Ridge efforts against the K-12 sapper at the time. Mm -hmm. Just absolutely fearless. So he and I got along like two peas in a pod. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't much like... He didn't much like authority. He had trouble with authority figures. Uh, and I didn't much like people who couldn't perform. Mm -hmm. So we figured out the differences and got rid of them and, and worked together pretty effectively. Uh, the troops responded to him uh, in, a, in a very good way. Uh, we, did, we didn't do anything significant for the next month. We went combat assaulted back toward Gladiator, got on a hilltop, got a bunch of guys come down with heat stroke because we come off a thousand foot mountain with low humidity and lots of wind to a lower area with lots of humidity and higher heat. So all of a sudden we were taking guys up in helicopters to cool them off. But then the range came back. We dicked around some lowlands and some water and we didn't do much. We just moved and moved and moved. I need to pause here right. for a moment. So we've gotten you now, uh, you, you've been on Ripcord, you've come off it, you're patrolling in this day in June, and, and not much is, ha is happening necessarily, not a lot of contact where you are. Right. Uh, and then, at what, now at a certain point, Vazquez goes out of the company, but you go out of the company too. Now, which one of those happens first? Well, well Vazquez remains the company commander mm -hmm. far Long after I leave. Okay. Uh, let me let me just hit this this one month of do nothing. Right. Right. Uh, significant actions. Well, there was not necessarily a lot of enemy contact. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the weird things that we came across was a perfectly rectangular piece of swamp. And I don't know why it's perfectly rectangular in the middle of the goddamn jungle. Uh, it, I don't. It's an anomaly. You, may, you might call it a geofact, mm -hmm. but we had to cross that, and we did. But we were very. It was very eerie. And we crossed it very carefully, uh, with lots of security left and right. The other thing that was that was a little weird, terrain-wise, was it came to a part of the map where the contour lines are dotted. They don't really match up with what's really there. Maybe there were cloud cover when the satellite went over and the cartographer decided to draw the map. And it did. But it's very clear that this particular two or three grid squares was, was not right. And we're in the middle of it. And it was, uh, it wasn't typical jungle. It, all of a sudden it opened up. It was like 
the park underneath. It was pretty clear. It wasn't much brush. And we slipped down the side of one hill, and, and I lost my footing, and I grabbed some young, tender bamboo shoots, and I ripped my hand to shreds. I mean, just right down to the, the gristle, because those young bamboo shoots will shatter like, oh, damn. I didn't mean to do this. Wrap it up. Maybe the jungle rot won't come back so bad. So those are two things mm -hmm. that, that impacted me. When we, when I moved the platoon, we did not move in single file. If the terrain allowed us to spread out, we moved in a, in a double column with a connecting link between the columns. Usually that connecting link was me with the third machine gun. Mm -hmm. uh, why present a single soldier to the enemy when you can broaden that front? Uh, and that's not in the books, but the books allow you to make those kinds of adjustments. Mm -hmm. We came uh, we came into a really jumbled part of the terrain toward the end of toward the end of May, maybe the third week in May. And I'm pretty much isolated from what's going on in the rest of the time. I'm not getting any news on record. Yeah. The gossip up from the RTOs has sort of died down. Vasquez only shares what he wants to share, and that's sort of limited. Our signal, our signal officer was also a class name, named John Darling. And John got on a chopper to take some radios out to one of the units in the field, Alpha or Bravo or Delta and the chopper got shot down and crashed and burned and everybody on board except the crew chief got killed. And they went out and put all the bodies in the body bags and put them in a sling and slung them out. We knew about this, but we didn't know any details. And we see the chopper going back. We knew the bodies were being slung. We knew it was ours. And so I bet you a body didn't fall out of that sling. It's in the body bag, right? Mm -hmm. it's, and so they're up about 1,500 feet, and it's falling into the jungle, and it's within within a kilometer of where we are. It comes crashing down. We don't know where it is, but I raised my hand and I said, "We'll go get it. It's not right." <coughs> so Vasquez said, "Okay." And we smelled it several hundred meters before we got to it. And we got to it, and we reslung it, and we had jungle penetrator come down and pluck it out. It was not pleasant. Only two guys went down there to handle that body. We confirmed who it was mm -hmm. by the guy's wallet in his back pocket. But uh, that was the only major enemy-oriented event that mm -hmm. happened in that in that period. And then on the 28th or 29th of May, we noticed that some trail watchers had been following us and digging in our sumps the day after we'd leave them. And, and you notice that by leaving stay behinds and a couple of guys just walking slower than they normally would behind you or you're leaving a squad here to look at things. So we decided we'd set a trap for these guys. And we did, and we, it's called an area ambush because you're not quite sure where they're going to come into that area, so you ambush the entire area instead of a point. Squad, squad, and a squad, and everybody made sea ration. Everybody made the rations for two days ahead of time, mostly mixing the water with the long-range patrol rations that we had because those were pretty quiet to eat, didn't have to open a can. I just wait, just wait for two days. When two days is over, nothing's happened, pick up and go. And as soon as we settle down, here comes the chopper from the fire base, a little light observation helicopter. And the radio crackles and Vasquez, uh, and he says, you get on this chopper. I said, okay. 
you go to the fire base. I said, all right. Berkey looked at me and he said, we're not going to see you again. I said, what do you know that I don't? He said, well, we're just not going to see you again. I said, okay. Uh, break up the ambush, no more. We've compromised the location. You take the platoon, the rest of the platoon up to uh, Vasquez and CP and he'll tell you what to do. And he said, you know I don't know how to read a map. I said, I know you know where that damn trail is. And just follow it till you get into Vasquez. Mm -hmm. So I thought I was, until that point, I thought I was going to be commander of Charlie Company. Mm -hmm. I thought Vasquez was going to leave. And it'd be a nice little fluid, comfortable, convenient, efficient handover. And I got to the fire base and Lucas was there, Charlie Lee was inside there, Kearney's Power was there, and the artillery liaison officer was there, and Rick Scaglione, the scout platoon leader, was there. And Lucas said, uh, do you want to command uh, Alpha Company? I said, sir, I'll do whatever you, whatever you say. He said, that's not what I asked you. <laughs> I asked you if you wanted to command that company. I said, yes, sir, I want to command that company. Okay, that's better. He said, now, if you're going to take over Alpha Company, you're going to do it as a captain. If General Wright can frock a colonel to brigadier, I can frock a first lieutenant to captain, and he pinned captain's bars on me. Mm -hmm. So I went to Alpha Company as a captain. Went back in the rear, spent a night, got my stuff moved over to Alpha Company, rear CP. And back out in the field the next day, straight to Alpha Company. And uh, that's how I started my new job. All right. Now, what was the situation, or what condition was Alpha Company in when you joined it? It was in good shape. It was in good shape. It was a good company. They were located somewhere south west of Ripport at that time. Not a, not a very descript location, but... Uh, but just out in the jungle someplace, yeah. but not on a on, main on, hilltop or anything. On a ridge line with the landing zone nearby, and I got on the landing zone. It was late in the afternoon, and the uh, former company commander, Albert Burkhart, who I had met once before briefly in the field, mm -hmm. uh, came out of the woods and I met him at the edge of the LZ and, and shook his hand and he said, uh, these are good men, take care of them. And I said, I will. And he was, he was gone. You know, there's not a lot of time for sword swapping or flag changing. Mm -hmm. He just knew it. One of the great that later on that evening, one of the radio operators asked me what I would like to be called. I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, we're not going to call you sir, and we're not going to call you captain. So, what do you want to be called?" I said, "What do you suggest?" And he said, "Well, how about Charlie Oscar for commanding officer?" Mm -hmm. So that's what it was. Okay. Yeah. All right. And how did you kind of present yourself to the company? Did you walk in and? Tell them all what to do, or did you look, observe and meet people, or what? Did, how did you handle it? No, I introduced myself to the command post. Uh, the forward observer at the time was a West Pointer class of '69 named Tom Brennan, so he knew me. Mm -hmm. uh, not well, but he knew me. Uh, so he was my instant ally, fellow officer, fellow West Pointer. Mm -hmm. He knew the company. Uh, Jeff Wilcox, my classmate, was the first platoon leader, I mm -hmm. believe, and he worked for me for three days before he got back to the rear to get his captain's bars pinned on normally and mm -hmm. take over Echo Company. Yep. So he was there, but he wasn't there in the, in the CP area. The first two guys to meet were the battalion radio operator and the company radio operator, the guy who carried the secure set, the guy who carried the radio for Tom Brown, and the CP medic. That's it. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
This is Sergeant Long. He's Vietnamese interpreter. He's from an Arvin unit, but he's been temporarily assigned to us on a permanent basis. Mm -hmm. So I had that eight-man CP. That was it. Uh, I believe I called the immediately available leadership. We weren't working as a company. We had platoons mm -hmm. moved around. I think I called immediately available leadership together and we sort of huddled and I said, hi, this is me and I'll be around to meet you guys in the morning. Time allows me to give me a little bit of time to get comfortable with it. In the meantime, this is where we're going to go tomorrow, what we're going to do, and blah, blah, blah. Got on the radio and then, you know, talked to the call signs. I mean, you're not saying hi to Fred, you're saying hi to a call sign. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the, the word is out, yeah. okay, and it's comfortable, and it's the way it's supposed to be. And we had, uh, I think we, I think we had a combat assault the next day, or an air movement or whatever. Without being too detailed, the the next week had these features that are important. We made a combat assault. Platoons were still dispersed in different areas. Uh, one platoon went to ripcord for a, a short time, maybe overnight. Another platoon was down toward Hill 805. Another platoon was with me. Uh, we combat assaulted into a little shit pot LZ uh, south, almost uh, almost yeah, southwest of Ripcord, but closer in. Had a new guy come to that LZ. He got killed that night by an RPG attack. I responded to the RPG attack by taking out a patrol from a third platoon to Games. The third platoon sergeant came to me afterward and said, that's not your job, that's our job. You know, we'll take the patrols out, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You stay here and be on the radios. I understood what he was saying. But my theory is that the enemy knew there was a new commander and they wanted to test him out. Mm -hmm. wanted to see what, what would happen, so you respond immediately. Uh, so now they know. Then no, no, we're going to pause at this point. Sure. The second tape is now out. All right. Now you were talking about the beginning of your stint as, right. as, as company commander. You talked about you thought the enemy had been sort of testing you out to see what would happen, so you showed them that. Yeah, you guess you guess that that, that happens. I mean, they're they're not ignorant of what's going on for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. they, they listen in on you. They know when your call signs change. I mean, it's, that can be demonstrated a number of different ways, a number of different ways. So I got the guy killed and a couple of guys wounded and reacted and the games didn't like the fact that I was putting myself at risk and I understood what he was saying. Mm -hmm. The next day we moved up closer to Ripcord. Funny story. I knew that where we were that night was uh, had been targeted by our mortars on Ripcord as a harassing and interdiction target that they would fire at random every night. And I called the fire base and I called to talk to the fire direction center and I said, I'm here. I know it's a target. I don't want you guys, I want you to tell the mortars not to shoot it. Okay? And until midnight, when the shifts changed, nobody shot it. When the shifts changed, they didn't get the word, and they shot it sometime around 1.30 in the morning. And you never really go to sleep over there. I don't think you go to sleep anywhere. You, you just had this... Everybody heard the mortars firing at 1.30 in the morning, even, even in the middle of a sleep. Somehow, my radio operators made it to the foxhole we dug. They made it to the foxhole before I did. There's three of us clamoring in this one foxhole, and the mortar rounds are going bam, 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 right across the top of the hill. Three rounds, that's all they fired. Nobody hurt. Woke up the, you know, got up the next morning, checked their gear. There's pieces of mortar fragment in the rucksacks and the smoke grenades hanging off our load bearing equipment. Everywhere you look, there's a hole from, from some mortar fragment. 
but nobody got hurt. And then, <clears throat> next day was uh, June 3rd. I had Lee Wiegeskog moving out ahead of the company with 2nd Platoon, and he was moving up just before you get to Hill 1000, there's a little low area. That's hot, but it's it's a smaller hill that's lower than Hill 1000. And his point team runs into a couple of guys brewing up their tea in the middle of the trail. Why didn't you shoot him? Mm -hmm. well, come on, guys. So I went back up the trail, and that's when. Uh, Waylon Norris got killed, Chuck Norris's older brother, mm -hmm. we, we know about that. He was walking slack for the point man, point man turns around, no, he was walking the point, point. Yeah. Yeah, and he turned around looking at the slack man and he got shot through the heart. Anyway, look, this, now we've got two or three guys who have been brewing coffee in the middle of the trail, holding up an entire platoon, and we don't know what the hell's going on up there, and I'm a couple hundred meters back with one of the other platoons. So I tell Lee very clearly, we're not going to stay on the side of the hill. I, I remember being on the side of the hill. It's getting on in the afternoon, 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the last time we stayed on the side of the hill around Ripcord, the enemy rolled hand grenades down on us all night long. I, I learned that lesson. I said, we need to get to the top of Hill 1000. We don't need to be on the side of the hill. Roger. But there's, nobody wants to go up there because there's bad guys up there. That's right. I said, well, let's, let's shoot some Cobras at them or, or something. So we brought cobra, Cobras in, shot the Cobras, went back up. And I think it's, I think, I think that's when Norris got killed. There was, mm -hmm. there was some suppressive activity going on and then Norris got killed and then nobody wanted to go up there. So I could see this unfolding in a way that was not the way I wanted. Got up, we'd seen a bad guy, we'd fallen back, we called in our tilt, we called in Cobras, uh, we went back up, Norris got killed. Nobody wants to go up again. So I bring the Cobras back, maybe we're shooting some, uh, some mortars, probably not artillery. And I realized that it's time to go forward, it's time to get up there and sort this thing out. I know where I want to be. And I and where lead we just got is right there at that time is not where I want to be. So I grab one of the radio operators and leave the, the leave the other one behind with the CP. I say, I'll call you, you bring the CP forward with this platoon when everything gets sorted out. But right now I don't need a clusterfuck up there. You guys stay back here. Just be ready to reinforce if I need you. Or just to join us when we get things sorted out. I got up there and there's, there's guys spread out behind logs, behind trees, and uh, looking up the hill, not knowing what's going on, waiting for somebody to do something. Well, you can go around and say, okay, you, you move up there. Well, it doesn't work that way. These guys have been moved back twice by their own imaginations, if nothing else, although you know, there was a guy that did shoot at him. So I figured, let's see, who's the kid that's farthest forward? This guy, blonde-headed kid from South Carolina. I asked him where he's from. He said, South Carolina. I said, oh, South Carolina guys have to stick together, right? He said, yes, sir. I said, who's your, who's your friend over there with, with the thump gun? He said, who it was. I said, can you put a round on top of that hill every 15, 20 seconds? Yes, sir, I can. Oh, I said, oh, no feisty son of a bitch. This is good. I got the farthest forward kid in the, in the platoon, and I got a guy who, who affirmatively answered a question that I asked him. I said, now, I told the South Carolina kid, I said, now, you and I are going to go up there. We're going to throw a hand grenade, and then we're going to run forward. Then you're going to throw a hand grenade, and I'm going to run forward. Then I'm going to throw a hand grenade, and you're going to run forward. And sooner or later, we're going to get to the top of that hill, and then nobody going to stop us. I said, when you start feeling comfortable, you shoot your weapon. You throw the hand grenade, run, shoot the weapon, you know, you know how that works? 
He said, oh yeah, yeah. I said, let me show you. I said, you throw a hand grenade up there. And he did. It blew up and I ran forward. And I threw a hand grenade, son of a bitch, if he didn't run forward. So now we're doing, they teach you this crap. This is, <laughs> this is regular old infantry stuff. Yeah. I mean, you learn it time and again. And the kid knew it. I mean, he'd been taught it. So pretty soon, and the thump gun is going off. So we got thump gun on top of the hill. We got hand grenades and shooting the rifles and moving forward. And before I know it, there's a machine gunner over here, manned by a kid named Galindo, and he's dragging a machine gun in one hand and an assistant gunner in the other hand. And he said, "Sir, you're not going up there alone." No, I had this kid from South Carolina, see, mm -hmm. he and I are going up there together. So now there's four of us going up there, him. And now that pretty soon there's Ouija Scott and his guy, a couple other guys going up the hill. And I look out there and there's a whole platoon doing this hand grenade crawling, shooting shit, going up the hill. And I just dropped back. I said, you know, they got it. They are doing what I want and they will accomplish what I want them to accomplish. And I dropped back and I got my radio operator and I said, call the rest of the company, don't, don't come up. So that night, we had a wounded guy out of it. This, this, this did not happen easily. Mm -hmm. We had some M79 rounds blow back on us and some guys got wounded from that. I mean, it was, the enemy was long gone. We weren't having a firefight okay. now. But we got, we got where I wanted to be. And we, we spent the night there. And uh, later on that evening, Senior lieutenant in the company, Jim Knoll, commanded third platoon. He called it. He called on the radio and he said, "Good job, Charlie Oscar. Mm -hmm. That's all it took." Yeah. If Knoll approves it, doesn't care what I what I think or what I feel I did that day. Mm -hmm. If Knoll says it's okay, then it's okay. All right. So this gets us to a point where we go in and stand down within the next couple of days. Mm -hmm company gets to know each other back in the rear and you get to know your lieutenants and your NCOs and you get to drink a couple of beers. You get to refit your, your equipment, get new rifles. Okay, so you so, got to so go in, stand down, get an acquainted yeah, with the company. We're in stand down. Platoon Sergeant, Lee's Platoon Sergeant comes to me and he says, sir, we're going to put you in for a Bronze Star or something. I said, no, you're not. I said, come on. We got a guy killed, we got a couple of guys hurt by our own stuff. I said, you know, what do I want an award for that for? You know, that's just backwards. So we're on stand down. Now, we stand down and we go back out to the field, we go back out to some place between Ripcord and O'Reilly. But before we get the company back out there, before we, and when we get back out there, we're going to go to Firebase O'Reilly. That's really an important element. I don't remember that we did a lot in the field once we got back out there to see some good scenery. But this is a good time to stop and say, why is Ripcord important? I don't know how many people have talked to you about that. I don't know that Keith Nolan got it in his book as, as clearly and succinctly or as clearly as he might have. Um, because for all the good things that Keith was, he, he was not an operational specialist with an Army background. He understood strategic things and he could tell the soldier's story. But somewhere in between mm -hmm. is, is the operational dimension and why things are important. We understand it's strategically important for the North Vietnamese to be able to infiltrate troops to the lowlands where the population centers are. If you're going to take over the country, you've got to take over the population centers. To do that, you've got to get troops down from the Ho Chi Minh Trail, down from Laos, down from the Asia Valley into the lowlands. In that part of Tatian province, the northern half of it, which has got the Nam Hoa district, which is the northern half of the A. Shaw Valley, plus out to Rocket Ridge where we were working and where Ripcord is. The Nam Hoa uh, district has two river valleys coming through it, the Song Lao and the Rao Trong. And they both come around the Kok Muen Massif on which Ripcord sits. And if you look at a map, it'll, it'll show this very clearly. And it, uh, it's in Ollie North, it, it, there's a very decent picture of it in Ollie North's war stories on Ripcord. 
the enemy needs the Rao Trong infiltration route and the Somalau infiltration route, and they can't dominate, as long as the U.S. dominates that massive around the Cock Nguyen, which Ripcord is on the largest hill mass, mm -hmm. the Cock Nguyen dominates, but it's yeah. too skinny, and the ridge line is too slender. So Ripcord and, and what's around it, which includes 902, 805, Hill 1000, Triple Hill, mm -hmm. that area is key. Well, it's a bitch to defend because it's so spread out and there's so many nearly equal height hilltops. So strategically, we understand why it's important. Operationally, how do you do it? Tactically, we know how to kill those guys. They know how to kill it. You know, it's, we can talk technique all day long. We can talk RPGs. We can talk hand grenades. But operationally, the enemy wants that, that hilltop not to be an orient. He doesn't want to own it. He wants us not to own it. So how do we do that? Then he secondarily, he's very concerned about us getting into A shop. And he knows we're likely headed out that way. We were headed that way the year before when we bumped into Hamburger Hill. So ripcord, as important as it is to the infiltration routes, if Ripcord supports a move into the Aishaw Valley, then it sets the enemy back even further. Mm -hmm. If they can keep us off Ripcord, they can move toward the lowlands. If they stabilize us on Ripcord, they accept stalemate. But if Ripcord supports us going into the Aishaw, which we were planning to do to a place called Bradley, which had been a fireplace before, been a couple of years before. It's in the northern end. Mm -hmm. It's 12 miles from Laos. Sometime in May, when I was still on ripcord with Vasquez, Lucas and Königsbauer, the S3, and uh, the artillery liaison, Dave Rich flew in the command and control Huey over the northern end of Laos. They had gun cover when they did this. They didn't just go out there and wander around. They had a couple of Cobras with them, a couple of loaches. And they observed enemy 152 millimeter mortar howitzers firing from Laos. Firing from Laos. Mm -hmm. Another country. Yeah. Onto Bradley. Registry. See the smoke. And so at that point, very soon thereafter, a decision was made not to go into Bradley. That ripcord would become its own, its own destination, mm -hmm. not become a stepping stone. At that point, we ceded the strategic advantage to the enemy. At that point, we seated operational initiative to the enemy. We were no longer in charge of the operation, and it was theirs for the taking, and they took it. You're no longer moving, so you don't really have the initiative at that point. That's right. That's right. So we decided not to put the ball in the air, and they decided to sack the quarterback, or try to, mm -hmm. to make the sports metaphor. Yeah. So uh, now, what do they do? This is May. They don't know we've made a decision not to go to Bradley. They just they, what what they all they can do is observe. Mm -hmm. And our actions, we what did we do? We started building. I mean, we were building, but we continued to emphasize building on Ripcord. And they sort of figure, well, it's now the end of May, first part of June. If they've not gone to Bradley, let's see, they've only got August and September to operate before the monsoons come back. Uh, if they don't do something by the end of June, then we've got them. And all we did was build. Well, if all they're doing is building, gee, they must be wanting to defend that fire base. Okay. If they want to defend that fire base, how do we tackle it? Well, we tackle it by standoff attack, the same way we did at Dan Ben Fo, same way we did at Quezon. We know how to do this. Mm -hmm. We don't always succeed, but sometimes we do. So we send teams out with the, their little gadgets, and they take measurements, and they take sightings, and nobody sees them, and they mark this spot on the trail with the 
with a cut on the tree or whatever, a dead twig or a twisted knot. And that's where you can fire this 60 millimeter mortar at this azimuth for this many seconds, this many rounds. You don't need a base plate, you just fire it and go. And you can fire the 82 from over here and down here we're going to... We're talking thousands of North Vietnamese working together to figure out how to do this. And they're doing it without most of them being detected. They're learning where the caves are, where they can put the 51 caliber machine guns. They're working below where we typically work. If you find an enemy above 300 meters, that's unusual. It means he's looking for you. If you go down below 300 meters, he'll chase you away. Jazz don't like to go below 300 meters in the mountains because that's where the leeches are. Mm -hmm. We don't like the leeches. So if you find yourself working in the valley, the troops start bitching and complaining. They say, no, we're down here for a purpose. And then he just melts away and lets you, lets you get uncomfortable. If you're not gone in a day or two, he'll, he'll, he'll piss on you and then you go away. Anyway. But the enemy knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. We had a pretty good idea how to operate tactically, but operationally, we gave it up. Mm -hmm. We gave it up. We knew how to defend that hill. That's the big question, whether or not we could have defended it against their tactical prowess or whether our tactical prowess was superior to theirs. I mean, you might argue that them taking 902 and 1000 and 805, but those were operational objectives. We, we, we were still defending that hill, mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't like Dan Van Vu. We were within, well within close air support range, and it wasn't, which is similar to K-Sign. Well, K-Sign was a hell of a lot bigger. Anyway, that's my viewpoint. Mm -hmm. That's my read on, on what was leading up to this. The fact that Operationally, they succeeded, uh, secured their strategic advantage. After Ripcord, we never controlled that piece of terrain again. We never contested them for the Ashaw Valley. Yes, it took them a few more years to, to get down from Quan Tree and mm -hmm. get into Way, and we had to deal with the Lamson, and they had to deal with Lamson 719, but uh, you know, that was just the last gasp of the dying army uh, it had its best units north and its best, its best units, while they might have been good enough for, for tactical operations, they weren't going to save the, the rotten South Vietnamese units down south. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, now they're going to go back in now uh, in, in the years. This is going on, but the American commanders are, at this point, how aware are we that this is going on, or this is what the enemy is actually up to? Oh, I don't think I don't think we're I don't think we're cognizant of it at all. I think I think we're we got ourselves in a mode of serial thinking that says if Ripcord is 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 a target for them, then they're going to come after it. We can kill a bunch of them. Yeah. And it, they weren't thinking outside that immediate. A follows B follows C kind of. Were they also assuming that we were going to be able to continue to operate in the same way that we had in the previous several years? We go someplace, they get out of the way, uh, that sort of thing. So well, you can think a company, a company can do X or Y, and just assume that things will work in the same way. Or work, or or work in the same way that it did at Hamburger Hill. Can yeah. we? Can we? Can we suffer losses like we did at Hamburger Hill and not draw the slings and arrows of, mm -hmm. of Congress yeah. or the American people or, or what have you? And the attitude in the 101st, right or wrong, was pretty much that we know how to do this and we don't need anybody telling us how to do it. And we'll be careful. But things have changed. A lot of guys didn't want to be careful, and they, they wanted to be—they wanted to be right. They wanted to be risk aware, but they didn't want to be overly cautious, mm -hmm. because they knew being overly cautious invited the enemy just as 
much as being too, uh, you know, too, too stupidly aggressive like mm -hmm. Custer. You know, you, you, there's, a, there's a balance. Yeah. But things have changed in that we no longer were fighting a war in which possession of territory meant that much. Let me see if I can say this in, in the right way. If we weren't going to possess all the territory, then possessing some of it had less meaning. If we weren't going to kick the enemy out of the Asia, if we weren't going to make a commitment to do that, which we should have done in 68, 69, which mm -hmm. we, and we didn't do, they were still there. I mean, that was their, their backyard stockpile. If we weren't going to get them out of the Asia, then what the hell were we doing on Ripcord? Stopping the infiltration. Mm -hmm. So being on Ripcord it didn't have the meaning that it would have had in 67 or 68. The meaning it would have had in 67 or 68 was to go into the Asia, to make it tough for them to be in the Asia instead of them making it tough for us to be on Ripcord. Mm -hmm. We gave up Bradley, we gave up the Asia. We gave up the Asia, we turned over Ripcord to them, they just had to take it. They had to figure out a way to take it. Yeah. So, if territory isn't, is less important, and the, and the reason it's important is to let you go somewhere where you can damage the enemy, you can kill the enemy. If territory is less important, then what becomes more important is killing the enemy. Well, you can't do that without taking the territory anyway. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're backpedaling the whole way now, hoping you can kill a bunch of enemy. It's a nice theory. If you can, if you sit there and you can suck in 10,000 enemy and you can kill them all, that's a nice theory. It doesn't work that way. I mean, it, we, we, we know this time and time and time again. You've got to be very active in going after it. Well, we tried. We didn't have enough guys to be that mm -hmm. active. We took the resources we had. Brigade took the resources they had. Division took the resources they had. We had the 17th camp going out in the hills. I mean, you look at the, the the top journals and the, and the records of history from the division, we had a lot of activity going on. The battalion had, but it was too little yeah. for the area. And if the enemy wants to stay hidden, they can stay hidden. When they want to come out and fight, they can come out and fight. When yeah. they came out and fight, we gave, we gave an excellent account. Very excellent. But to really prevent them from doing what it was that they were doing, that whole preparation and planning, you needed a lot more boots on the ground in a lot more places at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely. 100%. Now, once they kicked us off Ripcord, it didn't matter. As long as we didn't go back there, it didn't matter. They could use the infiltration routes on the Song, Olau, and the Rao Trong any time they wanted. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to do it the next day. They could do it the next year or the year after that. And they did. Mm -hmm. All right. Now let's steer ourselves back to you. Yeah. You've, got, you've got stand down, you head out now to this is, Riley. Yeah, this is all hindsight. Oh, that's, that's yeah. useful. It's a, yeah, certainly. Uh, it's an informed <coughs> opinion. Uh, so on top of that. So, uh, okay, so now you're, you're back. You've, you've, got your, you've got Alpha Company. You go back out to O'Reilly. Uh, there's other stuff going. And then we're, we're in June now uh, and heading toward July. Um, how long, I mean, how long do you stay around O'Reilly? or? what goes on there? Now we get back, uh, we actually go back out in the field for a couple of days mm -hmm. and then we get moved on to O'Reilly. Okay. O'Reilly is a sort of a neat little place. Very steep sides on the China Coast side, the north, and the uh, Ripcord side, the south. And very long, narrow ridges leading up to it from the west, but it drops off pretty steeply looking out toward Rock Ridge. Mm -hmm. And you can see Helen from there. Helen's, you know, five or six clicks away. So it's, it's all one contiguous part of the, the, the map, but the bridges are broken up. And you can see Camp Evans. You can see the South China Sea from O'Reilly. But it's a narrow little spine back thing. It's got three South Vietnamese 155s on it. Mm -hmm. So it's got half a Arvin battery there. And it's got an Arvin battery headquarters, and it's got a, a, 
a forward tactical operations center for the battalion, which co-locates with my company, CP. The defense of the hill has alternated between South Vietnamese forces and American forces, and it's now shifting to American forces for whatever reason. South Vietnamese forces are part of the very, very good Vietnamese First Division. Very, very good, capable commanders and, and soldiers. So we had about three weeks on a route. We got there at the end, you know, we, we were ordered to move up there at the end of June. I actually think they kind of had assaulted us a kilometer and a half to get, we could have walked there. But <laughs> they, wanted to, they wanted to make the show moving helicopters through the air. Uh, so we got there, we, we, we took over bunkers that had already been dug. The, the fire base had features that the South Vietnamese had made walkways in the wire, and the hillsides were so steep. The idea was that rather than have bunkers down low, that they would have soldiers walking around the perimeter. A soldier on his feet is going to be alert to something creeping up in the wire. Those sides were steep. I mean, in some places you had to use hooks to get up. But it had been attacked by the North Vietnamese several weeks before when it was defended by South Vietnamese soldiers. And the word was they killed 78 North Vietnamese attackers. I mean, just terrible. Somebody made a mistake. And the North Vietnamese paid for it. And there wasn't a single casualty on the South Vietnamese side. So we were pretty confident in defending that hill. <coughs> Ripcord started while we were on O'Reilly. And you can listen to this on the command net. You can listen to stuff happening. The first two rounds came in on July 1st, and then that night, July 1 to 2, Hill 902 got hit. And you listen to that on the command net. You listen to people you know, because mm -hmm. you were in Charlie Company. You listen to voices that you recognize. Uh, and you track along with it, but it, it becomes personal very quickly. Um, so you realize what's going on. You realize that this is not some insignificant thing. And in the, in the back of your head, you know that Henderson, Firebase Henderson, got overrun in May 6, 7. You had lost a classmate there, Rick Holly, the scout platoon leader. You know that you had other places that were hit by enemy action in, in the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. And if you look, if if you look at these other actions, actions down around fire bases, Catherine, Maureen, mm -hmm. if, and if you, if you look at these actions on a map and you stick the pins in the map, you see Ripcord is right here in the middle, and all these actions are going on in the months ahead of time mm -hmm. around. And they're drawing U.S. and Arvin forces away from the main area of interest then all of a sudden the whole world is paying attention to ripcord. Too late then. So if you, if you, if you look at the pins in the map over May and June, you, you, you see enemy actions, the economy of force actions, two or three enemy drawn away 15 or 20 U.S., five or six enemy drawn away 20 or 30 U.S. They're all being drawn away from ripcord. And then report happens, and you keep listening to stuff, and, the next, and all of a sudden you realize that this is why I was sent here. Mm -hmm. That in a day or two or less than a week, I'm going to be out there. I'm going to be in the middle of that, and i got to get ready for it. So how do I get ready for it? How do troops get ready for it? I know who I'm going to lose. I know what I'm going to lose. I know how much. I know what the proportions are. I mean, I, I had somehow in my head, somewhere I learned along the line, some operations research class or some statistic discussion that uh, X number of guys going to go. So you make sure they can shoot their weapons. You put hot weapons in an infantry guy's hand, he has a smile on his face. You make sure that he knows how to shoot that machine gun, that 
M79, he knows how to shoot that law, he knows how to shoot his rifle, he knows what tracers do, he knows what ball does, he knows what a 45 caliber pistol looks like. You don't slack off on a thing, you practice throwing hand grenades. You practice, practice, practice. So we did that. We'd have turkey shoots. It wasn't just pitching stuff out there. We'd have mad minutes in the morning. We'd have contests to see who could hit white star parachutes hanging in the trees 900 meters away. Can you, are you that accurate? Mm -hmm. Well, effective range of an M16 is only 460 meters. You're not supposed to be able to hit something 900 meters. But I will show you how to do that. If I can show you how to hit something 900 meters, will you promise me you will kill that guy at 30 feet? See, I can, I can make those deals, and, and, and you, will, you will promise me that, because I will show you how to hit that light star parachute at 900 meters. And, and troops love this stuff. Mm -hmm. They want to show what they can do. They want to show that they're better than the next guy. They want to show especially that they're better than the officers. Mm -hmm. And the officers, these cocky sons of bitches, always running around telling us what we can and can't do and making sure we go to jail on time. Bam, 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 bam. I can shoot better than he can. Well, guess what, dude? I'm, I'm the best thing ever happened to you, and I can shoot better than you can, too. But they love that stuff, and it's always back and forth. And nothing, nothing's ever that clear cut. Mm -hmm. Or oh, he's better than me. It's, we're glad we're working this together. But little things like, if you want to hit, if you want to max range any weapon, you shoot it 44 and a half degrees up, and it'll land the maximum mm -hmm. distance. I mean, you probably know all this from personal experience, but I had to study it and I had to do it. Well, troops don't know, and people don't know this. Mm -hmm. The average guy on a street corner does not know. <coughs> that if the book says a law will go 1,100 meters, that to make it go 1,100 meters, you shoot it at 45 degrees. When I showed the troops that you could hit that landing zone 40, 1,100 meters away with a law shooting at 45 degree angle, everybody's going, oh, he can't do that. Yeah, he can't. No, he can't. I think I heard a knock. Okay. So you're getting your, your basic, you, you're getting yeah. your men ready to, to go out there and and you and you showing them everything they need to know to be confident in you and themselves and, and what what they've got to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and and a lot of that confidence comes from demonstrating the skill with, with weapons. And if you can use that weapon like a trick shooter like Annie Oakley, that, that's all the better. Mm -hmm. Guys remember that. Guys think about that. And so I had a new platoon leader for 1st Platoon, Bill Piesa, West Point class of 69. He was a classmate of Tom Brennan, the forward observer. Uh, Tom wrote to Bill, they were friends at school, very close friends. Tom wrote to Bill and said, there's a company, you need, you need to come to this company. And it will have a platoon open up when Jeff Wilcox leaves. You need that platoon. And the ace had put down in history. I thought I was being insistent when I put down 101st five times. Mm -hmm. The ace put down 1st Platoon, Alpha Company, 2nd <laughs> Battalion, 5 or 6 Infantry. He was very precise in where he wanted to be assigned. And he got his wish. Mm -hmm. And he got to the company, and of course, uh, if he got that far, I was going to give him 1st Platoon. And it worked out. Unfortunately, for the friendship, Tom had already been reassigned to artillery. Mm -hmm. Italian headquarters, and so he was, I was. He was replaced with a new forward observer named Steve Olson, uh, and Steve was new, second lieutenant, very competent, but inexperienced. Uh, and Bill was new, uh, inexperienced, but he had an aura about him that just said, "Follow me." There, I mean, just look at this guy that you wanted to be in his outfit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had Piesa in first, I had Weegis Gog in second, I had Jim Nolan third, I was full up on platoon leaders except for Dick Ames in third platoon went back to rear because he was getting short. And I figured, well, Noel is the best there is. He, we can do it without Ames. Mm -hmm. And Ames was a sergeant. He was a sergeant. He 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 was on his second tour. He'd been over first tour back in 
67, 68 with the 25th Division down south. They'd been in a regimental sized ambush and, and came out of it. I mean, he'd seen some stuff, so it, it wasn't like he didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. He was good from Maine, had that Maine accent. Um, so we were organizationally fit, ready to go. We had people from the rear working out of our O'Reilly. Jump talk there, forward talk there. Uh, O'Reilly was a place to sit and get ready to go to war. All this right. wasn't anything else. Now, in the meantime, now, let's see, there has been fighting around Hill 1000 again, uh, a variety of other issues. There, other companies are running into things. When do you now go back out in the field? We come back sold out on 10 July after we've decided that Hill 1000 isn't going to be taken. And we listen to all this on the command side. Mm -hmm. we, we can watch a lot of it. We, can have direct, we have direct line of sight to Hill 1000 <coughs> from O'Reilly. So we can see a lot of this happening. But we combat assault into the LZ just east of Ripcord, which everybody uses all mm -hmm. the time, day in and day out. Uh, Charlie Company, Charlie Company is going to come to O'Reilly. How does this work? We go in to that LZ and everybody's supposed to be lying down on the birds and make it look like they're empty. And we sort of roll off and Charlie Company gets on and they sit up and make it look like the birds are full. I, I don't know if this, this kind of stunt ever works. But we did it. And Charlie Kempney went to a rally. We got off and there's, there's gunfire not too far away, maybe two or three hundred meters. But it's not shooting at us, it's shooting at ripcord or shooting at the birds or whatever. So we know we're, we're, we're back in it, some way, shape, or form. We moved down the hill a little bit. We hole up in a decent night defensive posture, but far enough away in the woods, we don't think it's going to be an issue. But everybody and their brothers been holing up on this ridge all summer, all spring, and summer long. I mean, it's not like it's an unknown place. It's just hard to get to mm -hmm. for the enemy. <clears throat> on the eleventh. The 11th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 11th we move farther. On the 12th, Lucas, Lucas says he wants Hill 805. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he said, I'm going to send Chris Straub up there from the south, and I'm going to send you up from the Ripcord Ridge from the, uh, from the north. Chris, Chris is going to come down south from the north, and I'm going to come southeast from the northwest. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I don't know Chris, I don't know Delta 2501, but they have a good reputation. So I talked to Chris on the radio, and he's they're going to make a combat assault closer to 805, and I'm going to walk up there. And we coordinate our assault. We agree that he'll get the high part of the hill, I'll get the lower part with the landing zone on it. We're not mm -hmm. going to interfere with each other. We, we, we draw coordinating lines between the two companies, so point teams aren't going to shoot each other up. I mean, it's not something you take lightly. Mm -hmm. when, two different, when two companies from different battalions try to work together, that's not the easiest thing in the world. I don't want to gloss over it. So we move out. And we get down to the saddle, be, getting ready on the way to up Hill 805. And sure enough, we run into a couple of bad guys with a machine gun. Mm -hmm. And they know we're coming. Well, it's no big surprise. It's, that's just where they want to engage us. They didn't want to engage us somewhere else because this is the least risky place for them. And Jim Knoll knows it's going to happen. 
and he's trying to keep his guys, you know, keyed on it. But they still get oh, get down, get surprised. Well, Noel wasn't having any of this stuff. I mean, machine gunner ran forward like they're supposed to do, and he grabbed the kid and said, "You lay down a base of fire." And he grabs his radio up, and he's running off to a flank. You know, you fix him and you flank him. You fix him and you flank him. And he was doing good. The enemy saw him coming. They got up and started running around. A stray AK round bounces off a hardwood tree and hits Noel in the calf. Bam! He's down like a, you know, like a sheaf of wheat. He doesn't know what's wrong with him. He comes hollering for the medic. The medic says, you come over here. And Noel says, I don't know. Turns out he's just got a bruise about the size of a grapefruit. But the enemy gets away. I got a medic back, Noel. Lucas has got the ass because we're not moving. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, you got to report this shit to me. I said, ah. yes, sir. So we get cranked up again. We're moving up there. Nobody wants to go up there. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's going up there, but nobody wants to go up there. But we get, you know, the best platoon leader in the, in, the, in the battalion, for crying out loud, has just got a leg wound. Nobody wants to go up there. So all of a sudden, I'm jerking guys around. I was going to lead with Noel. Mm -hmm. Well, I still do, but now I'm the platoon leader because I don't have Noel anymore. And I, as much as I like Pace, I'm not ready to put him in the lead yet. And I'm not ready to put Weegis Gog in. I mean, we're, we're still going to go up there, but mm -hmm. Weegis Gog is, is the other lieutenant that can do something. Mm -hmm. he, he's got the experience to do something. So we call in the artillery, we call in the mortars, we talk to Delta Company 2501. Yeah, we're moving, we're being shadowed. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna break out of the trees here in a minute. We're gonna stop at that LZ. You guys get the high ground. We're not don't shoot. Now we're not gonna shoot. You know, just I mean it's good GI chatter. And we break out of the trees and we're on the LZ and we see the high ground at 805, mm -hmm. a couple hundred meters away, and we see Delta breaking out of the woods. We know they're GIs. Mm -hmm. We're waving and they're waving. And they get the high ground and we get the LZ. And it's over. Mm -hmm. It's over. What are you going to do? We got it. Yep. There, there's no bad guys. It's Nobody's shooting back at us. Now we got to defend this and we got four hours. So, well, let's put it together. I'm really pleased. I mean, I know how difficult it is to coordinate with somebody from not your unit mm -hmm. and how rare it is to have a split command. I mean, usually there's a chain of command mm -hmm. and two captains getting together to agree on something is, is rare. I mean, if you've read Black Hawk Down, you, you see another reasonably successful uh, event that, that ended up essentially being a split command between the Rangers and Delta Force. But, uh, so, but it doesn't happen often. So Straub and I coordinated defensive fires between our two companies. I do not recall if I actually physically went over there. I don't think I did. Uh, but we were as close as, our positions were as close as 100 meters and center of mass, more like 200, 250. Uh, Straub and I agreed that I could have the mortars from Ripcord and that he would have priority over everything else, mm -hmm. which meant artillery, all artillery, which meant the Quad 50 up on Ripcord and close air support from any jets and meant the Cobras. Anything other than those mortars on ripcord, he could have. That's a giving away a lot. I mean, most guys wouldn't do that easily. Mm -hmm. But I knew that the importance of Hill 805 and him defending it far outweighed the importance of me being there for one night on the landing zone. Why go through the trouble of handing over all the assets? If I had argued for and gotten mm -hmm. some assets, the more I got, the more I had to hand back to him. So the plan was to leave him up on there, 
on top to deny it to the enemy. Yes. And you were going to operate in other places. Yes. Now, he didn't like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a lot for two company commanders not to like. And the fact that we both worked together as effectively as we did is, uh, I think, is really a good tribute to our training, edu mm -hmm. education, and, and probably to our leadership in our battalions as well. Straub didn't want to stay up there. He didn't like being static. And he envied me getting the opportunity to, to keep on moving. Uh, so anyway. So what happens that night? Well, we both think something's going to happen. I mean, I had contact. They've been shadowed. It's not like company commanders ever detect somebody shadowing them. The point teams and the guys mm -hmm. walking security on the flanks. I mean, you you can pick this stuff up. Troops know better than you do in many cases anyway. So if they're being shadowed, they think something's happening. They dig in as best they can. It's really rocky up there. <clears throat> they set out mechanical ambushes and claymores and all the good little toys that they have. We set out a bunch of claymores and trip flares. Sergeant Jerry Singleton had just become the new platoon sergeant for first platoon. He was built the ACES platoon sergeant. And he is in love with technology stuff. And we just had first sergeant got some uh, personal anti-intrusion device sets, PSIDs. And he he wanted to employ those. And we tested them, we played with them. He set them out along our back trail coming up to the landing zone. And he's listening to them. It's getting dark. Straub, one of Straub's mechanicals goes off about 10.30. Singleton says, I got a lot of movement coming up the trail. I, said, I listen. Fire it up. I mean, this, if this technology is telling us the truth, there's a bunch of bad guys on that trail. You don't got anybody down there, do you? No. Well, fire it up. So about the time we're cranking up mortars to fire targets that we can't see, all we hear is through these motion detectors, vibration detectors. Straub is beginning to engage enemy over on the other, the exact opposite side of the hill. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, everything just bursts into and the gunfire and RPG fire and explosions and this, that, and everything. Most of Hill 805 is barren. To get close to Stravis people, you've got to cross some open area. And amazingly, the sappers do. I mean, they get close. They, they, somehow they fold themselves into gullies in the dirt that you don't think of cat could hide in, but they're hiding in it. <clears throat> but when the flares go up and the claymores go off, <coughs> these guys are silhouetting. And my guys can see them. Straub's people are engaging them. We've already coordinated where you shoot. Shoot left of this and shoot right of that. <coughs> So I go over to tell my guys to start shooting. You got targets. <coughs> get some water. Yes. So basically now you're firing, Straub's firing. We start firing. We got targets. I go to Weegis Gog and, I, and he gets his guys cranked up, his machine guys. I mean, just all put up on him. I go over to third pretend, get a couple of thump gunners and have them start shooting. Now it's now I feel we're like we're under control. That we're not being hit because Singleton's got mortars coming in on the guys coming up. Mm -hmm.
Stroud seems to have things under hand. Quad 50s are working out. Artillery's working out. He's getting all that support pre-planned, just what we what we asked for. Uh, I feel like uh, I can wander around and be a tourist for a little bit. That Stroud is still getting RPGs shot at him from someplace down the way he came, where he was being shadowed. So I said, well, I'm going to take a light anti-tank -tank weapon, our rough equivalent of an RPG, only not nearly as range-worthy or effective. Mm -hmm. I take one, I go up in the landing zone, and I look down toward the way the enemy RPG fire is coming, and I try to fire a law down that way, light anti tank weapon, and it doesn't fire, it's a dud. I grab another one, and that works. And this law rocket goes down, dark, 11 o'clock at night, and it blows up in the middle of a bunch of enemy guys, or blows up where the RPGs were coming from. And there's this, again, there's this dead silence. What's that? And all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of RPGs coming right back at us. And I head for the foxhole at Singleton and Pace, and I jump in, and all these RPGs burst all around, mostly outside the perimeter. Singleton has a presence of mind to count them, 15 of them. They don't know quite where we are, but they, they're just it's like sticking your finger in a, in a hornet's nest. And I said, well, Singleton said, sir, don't do that again. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but that's 15 RPGs that Straub doesn't have to deal with. So, no, I won't do it again. So, enemy made a mistake. They didn't do an adequate recon. They weren't, they were pretty much unaware that we were on that LZ. Mm -hmm. Fighting was over, midnight, midnight 30. Strab had nobody seriously wounded, maybe 16 guys lightly wounded. Uh, I had I had nobody wounded. Zero, zip, not a net. Lucas came out the next day, talked to both of us, reinforced to Strab that he would be staying there. Strab was not happy about that. Brought some supplies out, got some scarf. Some uh, sundry packs, some extra this, some extra that. Guys loaded up. We got ready to move off. Lucas gave me a couple of, uh, he said, oh, I've got some fast movers for you to use. You can put them in anywhere you want. And I said, well, uh, okay. I put them in on my planned route of march down into the valley, and they, they had some uh, ammo supply. It hit something. And fast movers reference jets. Right? Yeah, F4s in this case. And they had, as I recall, they had 750 pound bombs, so big bombs, wasn't really close air support. And I put them in about 2,000 meters away on a hillside. Whatever they hit, the forward air controller in his OV-10 was very, very happy. He said, oh, we got all sorts of secondary explosions. I asked him, I said, how, how can you tell what you hit? He said, well, blue means this, and red means that, and green means something else. And I said, if you're happy, I'm happy. The troops are happy. we got a ringside seat. We're sitting up on a hill, 2,000 meters down there. The bombs are going in. The ripcord's way up yonder. These secondary explosions are going off. The troops are getting ready to move. We're going to move a couple hundred meters, maybe, maybe 400 meters, to a night defensive position. And uh, they got a ringside seat on this air show. So, you know, they're loving it. And now we get secondaries. Oh, yay. And we just got food and stuff from home, and we're good to go. So we move off the hill. We, we spend the night at, at a, again, a not very good night defensive position. We're, we're sort of off on a, we're not on a hill. We're on a little ridge tucked away nowhere. And Straub gets it to the end that night. 
and enemy soldiers are running right by us because they don't know where we are. And once again, in, in the middle of doing, in the middle of them not knowing where we are, punch off a couple of claymores, and catch it. And again, there's this, what the, who's doing this to, I mean, the enemy just didn't know whether to pick his nose or wind his watch, mm -hmm. and he just tried to get out of here. So again, bad guys were not coming after Straub because we were messing with him, and Again, we weren't hurt. They didn't know where we were. But it just tells you how many were out there. Yeah. To come at us the second night, again, inadequate reconnaissance, again, going after Straub from multiple directions, and us bumping into one of them, or them, one of those assault groups bumping into us and us messing with them, and there's still enough assault groups to give Straub a hard time for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can this be? And that's just not the way they had normally done things before. And and we're not thinking about that. We're just, mm -hmm. we're, we're thinking, well, this is, we're supposed to be able to handle this. And, and so far we were. I mean, we were being successful. Straub's guys were being successful. Mm -hmm. We were being successful. Ripcord was being successful. We lost we had a problem with 902, we had a problem with Hill 1000, but the tide was changing. We had Alpha Company and Delta 2501 out there, things, things were getting back on track. Except Delta 2501 is essentially under siege, aren't they? I mean, they get hit, they stay up there and get hit night after night. Yeah, but they're tying down the enemy. Yeah. They're tying down the enemy. Lucas had to be at least satisfied with that. So they'll be doing that for something like eight days, and you keep moving. Five days. Five, okay. Four, four, I think, I think four or five nights. No, five or six days. I keep moving. But we still don't know what we're really up against. When I go down into that valley the, the following day, and I'm just barely getting down into it, this is... On the 14th, the day after I put in the airstrike that gets the secondaries mm -hmm. on the, it's on the, it's the day after that airstrike that we actually move through that airstrike area. We're easing down into that valley by a, a sort of a roundabout way. We still don't know what we're up against. Lucas tells me on the secure side go down in that valley and look for graves, we know we have to be hurting them. He doesn't tell me to go down and strike an enemy battalion. He doesn't go down and tell me to set up an ambush for an enemy regiment. He doesn't, none of this stuff, not, nothing specific. Look for enemy graves, we know we have to be hurting them. <clears throat> Well, it's more than that, but we don't know enough to be specific. We don't have any details yet. But that's all right. I've got a rifle company. We can do any damn thing we want. Mm -hmm. We're the big boys on the block. And we are. We go down that valley, we start finding stuff. First thing we found was a fresh bunker and some fresh feces lying around it. We knew that whoever was occupying it just got out of there. We decide to not dig foxholes, we move light, easy, don't make noise. Got up in the middle of the night, I heard something, got everybody rucked up, we moved down. First, first light, where we had been, <clears throat> was attacked by mortars, 15 to 20 mortar rounds came slamming into our night defense position. I was, we were gone. Mm -hmm. guys, guys were looking around and saying, how does he know to move, you know? Doesn't matter if we're making noise. How does he know? I don't know. I'm just, if, you, if there's bad guys everywhere. Lee Weegiscog takes a 
six rounds, one five five that afternoon. Somebody just fires our own artillery into his area without checking with me. I'm, I'm bitching at the new S3 up there. Don't fire. I'll tell you when I want you to fire. All right. This tape is just about to.